first, I, I just want to say this. Um, Sean is the true, and I, I'm embarrassing him. He actually didn't want public recognition <laughs> for this. He didn't want the media. Uh, but I, I felt his selfless act, which was truly courageous, was a critical statement at a critical time in our city's history where we've seen this uptick in uh, hate crimes towards Asian American individuals in our community, including the Consul General of Japan and, and many, many others. Uh, Sean intervened. And as I told him earlier today, I, I'm not necessarily recommending that people intervene in these types of situations. I can't in good conscience. Uh, but I'm glad he did. And I think in the process, he not only uh, saved the individuals who were being harassed and attacked by the individual in question, but I believe he may have also helped this individual now get back on to the path of recovery. And so I, I felt it was important for our Asian and Pacific Islander American community here in Portland to know that there are people in this city who will stand up for them even during the most difficult circumstances. And that's why I felt it was important, and my staff felt it was important, and frankly, members of the community felt that it was important that we recognize you here today. And, and Sean, I'd, I'd like to ask you to, to just make a few comments, whatever you feel comfortable saying. Uh, we'd, we'd love to have the opportunity to hear from you. Yeah, I appreciate it, Mayor. Um, it was a very unfortunate situation on Labor Day, um, something that I necessarily wouldn't like to be in the position of, but I'm happy that I was there. Uh, I think it's just very important that people who respect the city, that grew up in the city, continue to treat each other, you know, how they'd want to be treated in the golden rule, um, to help put the city in a good light. So thank you for the certificate. Uh, it's much appreciated. Thank you. And uh, I, I'd also just like to say a thank you to the members of the APIA Council who could be with us here today, Christine and Neil. Thank you. I don't know if you would like to make a couple of comments as well. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler, Maps, Rubio, Gonzalez, and Ryan for having us here. Um, the Portland Police Bureau API Advisory Council was created two years ago due to all the anti-Asian hate. And as you know, um, every year it keeps doubling or tripling, even with the last couple years of uh, legislation and media attention, it's still increasing, and I can't figure out why you would think people are more aware. Um, so um, there's a lot that's happening with anti-Asian hate and, in general, um, any hate or racism. And we want to thank Sean for stepping up. I'm happy he was safe and nothing happened to him. Um, and he was very brave and courageous in helping out the, the Asian community. So we also want to thank him and thank you for having us here. Thanks, Christine. Neil, did you want to add something? The, uh, I am a director under the Asian Pacific Islander Advisory Council for the Police Bureau, um, but I'm also president of the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association and Portland's Lee Association here in town. Um, and you know, the thing about Asian crime, it is on the rise. In fact, I'm dealing with, with a, another group in Seattle which is dealing with the same issues. And uh, I just want to thank Sean here and appreciate that what he did. Um, you know, we need people to stand up because the Chinese community has always been quiet and uh, we need support. Uh, of course, we are speaking up these days, which is good. Um, but again, thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. Natasha, did you want to add anything? Thanks. Great. Um, so let, let me just make a couple uh, of comments here. Thank you, Sean, first of all, for your words and thank you for your willingness to be here today. Uh, and uh, I, I want to thank, of course, the members of the APIA Council who, who are here. Uh, as you just heard, the uptick in anti-Asian hate crimes over the past few years has happened all across the nation, of course, but it's happening here in Portland, and it's extremely distressing to our community. And as the mayor of Portland, I want to be crystal clear that I condemn all hate crimes, including anti-Asian hate crimes, including the events that happened on September 4th, where Sean so bravely intervened. Portland is a great city, and we're lucky to have people like Sean. It's, uh, I can clearly say now, uh, 
more than ever that I'm pleased to stand with our Asian American community and people like Sean who will stand up and defend the Asian American community in our city. This is a community which, as everybody in this chamber knows, has given so much to Portland, whether it's culture, civic, or economic contributions. Portland's Asian American community is an immense part of what makes Portland, Portland. I hope that as a community we can continue to reflect on what more we can all do to keep anti-Asian bias crimes from becoming normalized. Uh, again, thank you, everyone. I'll open this up to my colleagues. I see Commissioner Maps has his hand up first. Commissioner Maps, thank you. Well, thank you much, very much, Mr. Mayor. And I'll join the mayor and I'm sure all of my colleagues in thanking Sean for your courage um, for leaning in in situations like this. I also want to take a moment uh, to join the mayor and I think all Portlanders in denouncing anti-Asian violence. I have been truly horrified and kind of mystified by to see the recent a relatively recent reemergence of, of violence against Asian American uh, Portlanders. Um, we hear it, we barely go a week without hearing about some incidents like this. I've seen them in Old Town. I was just out meeting with folks in the Asian, at the Asian Family Center uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they've had bullets through their uh, uh, windows. Um, in, in recent years, um, I have many friends uh, who are close to me who come who are members of the Asian American community, and I know this causes real fear and pain in their lives. I want everyone uh, who feels that fear to know that this council and their neighbors stand with you. This is intolerable, um, and we will not allow this to be part of Portland's culture moving forward. Um, Sean is a great example of the way Portlanders can come together to make sure that we keep each other safe, and um, there are ways you can do this large and small. Uh, um, so I want to encourage um, every Portlander to look out for your friends and your neighbors, regardless of the color of their skin or the country that their parents or grandparents came from. Uh, but we, the way we maintain a safe community is by looking out for each other. Sean, you really embody that and you're a role model for all of us and thank you for being here today. I can tell it's a little bit painful for you. Uh, for you. Uh, 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 um, but your uh, courage and your humbleness is an inspiration to us all. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Gonzalez. Well, Sean, I, I again want to echo my colleague's comments and stepping up, uh, doing what we were all raised to do, and that's be decent uh, in the face of bad things. And unfortunately, in our city, we're seeing too much of this, uh, particularly what our uh, Asian communities, and which are incredibly diverse, what they're facing in our city right now. Um, it's, it's something of sadness It's a, uh, and anger. Um, and uh, but it is unfortunately truly shared across our communities uh, as diverse as they are we're we're all dealing with a more violent city a more hateful city at the moment and uh, there's has to be a, a law enforcement component of that that has to be neighbors uh, stepping up and intervening uh, as you have and then we have to rebuild the social fabric in our city uh, day by day and step by step. It's all of the above. And it sounds like there was a behavioral health component of this, which is a longer, more complicated uh, story right now in our state and in our region. Um, but again, I appreciate uh, you stepping up and doing what's decent. And very, very sorry uh, to your community that you're having to face this again. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for um, having a pre-gavel moment <clears throat> on this topic. Actually, what I, I want to say is um, I like the fact that the four of you are sitting together. Um, Sean, you're, you did the heroic act, but it, the bigger picture, I look to the leader um, here from the police bureau, and I'm just curious on what the dialogue is like in the police bureau about this spike. And, um, and I, I go back to being a leader in Seattle's queer community way back when, and there were a, a real spike in um, violence against uh, gays and lesbians in the Capitol Hill area, if you will. And it really took um, working with the police bureau. I did so many ride-alongs um, during that period of time. So just wanting to hear about any concrete steps that um, is helping um, from a very diverse community that, um, has probably some cultural barriers that, that you could speak to, but I'm just curious on what we're doing with this current moment. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Rea, uh, and respective commissioners. To uh, Commissioner Ryan's point, I am on behalf of the Chief's Office and our police members very honored and delighted that for the last three years, we had the honor and privilege and trust of a very robust and rich and diverse API community that comes to meet with us, or we go into their spaces to meet with them, to engage in a civil discourse, in a hard conversations about unpacking and deconstructing such a complex societal problems in addition to criminal justice issues. And this morning, we had about hour and a half of our regular meeting with the community partners and the chief's office to tackle those really hard issues about from how to empower and support and elevate our patrol officers who are the frontline uh, responders to persons in crisis to empower them with tools, knowledge, and resources so that we can walk away feeling somewhat accomplished and provided comfort um, in community members' safety and well-being and restore their trust. But we're also tackling issues organizationally and structurally, how our policies, our training, our procedures can support that, support what community wants and needs and expects of us. So I'm really honored that for the last three years we had those honest conversations honest input you know, this really beautiful city that, that thrives on activism and ownership of the process reforms, not just waiting to be told how to be governed. So I'm very proud and honored to be part of this conversation where we can police with our communities and shape what that means, whether it's a hate crime or, or any other livability issues and concerns to our safety. So I know that we have tangible, with uh, Christine and Neil's help, that a very business-centric and uh, action tangible goals oriented, we do have a roadmap how to address um, and better support our patrol infrastructure, but also our detective division and overall how to re-earn trust with communities uh, impacted by hate crime. Thank you so much. I just wanted to hear May some I say stories. something? Um, oh, yes, we have course. asked um, the chiefs to be involved in the community and they have stepped up. We've had community events. Um, when there is serious um, violence in the community, in the APIA community, um, they have stepped in and helped out and addressed the community. So we are happy with when we need them, they're there. Um, because that is what's going to um, close the gap with the community and the community will show um, a lot more, um, how do you say, <laughs> openness, um, with the Portland Police Bureau because I think it's, um, uh, we need more community action between the PPB and the communities. And thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, I just will end with this, that we've had two incidents on our block. Um, and at first time, we, it seemed random. Second time, it did seem targeted. And I doubt if this person's filled out a report. So you know there's so much underreporting about this issue as well, and your heads are nodding. Anyway, just to hear that there's ongoing dialogue and that you're fully engaged. And now back to you, Sean, thank you. Thanks for um, having great instincts and being brave. I appreciate you. Thank you, Commissioner, Commissioner Rubio. Um, I just wanna jump in also and just say thank you for, um, Sean, for your acts of courage and for really just doing what's right in your heart. And I think what's really important for me in this example is um, that we, um, our communities, need to be watching out for each other and recognizing the, the, the humanity and the dignity in one another. And not say uh, regardless of background, I don't like when people say that, but really because of our differences and our differences are just as okay and valid as our neighbor right next to us. And so I appreciate that you're seeing that. I appreciate the work that you're all doing to recognize that difference is what makes us um, stronger and better. And uh, we should fully acknowledge it and embrace it. And um, so thank you. Thank you for what you did. Thank you. And, and Natasha uh, from the Police Bureau, I, I also just want to call you out. Uh, your name comes up frequently as police commissioner. I hear good things about the work you're doing in the community. And you'll continue to do that work. And as Chief Lavelle moves into his new community leadership position, I know he's looking forward to working with you on this. Um, so I, I, I don't want you to get uh, to leave here without also being embarrassed by your good work <laughs> on behalf you. of all of us. You make us look good. You have accomplished that. 
embarrassment element. Oh, good. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm not done embarrassing Sean quite yet. One, one more matter, and that is I want to read the public commendation because it's, it's worth reading into the record and having. Whereas on September 4th, 2023, Sean Milligan directly intervened when two young women of Asian descent were violently targeted in an anti-Asian hate crime outside of a restaurant in Northwest Portland. And whereas the perpetrator had been loudly shouting anti-Asian rhetoric at passersby, and when he became physically violent, Sean and a restaurant employee forced the man to the ground and held him there until the Portland Police Bureau officers arrived. And whereas Sean Milligan's courage and bravery in intervening on behalf of others in a dangerous situation is commended by the Portland City Council as his actions are a shining example of the best of Portland's values. And whereas September 4th's attack is part of a worrying nationwide growth in anti-Asian hate crimes and the latest in a series of anti-Asian bias crimes in the Portland region. And whereas reports of hate crimes and incidents to the Oregon Department of Justice's bias response hotline have almost tripled in the last three years, with reports of anti-Asian incidents increasing 190% between 2020 and 2021. And whereas in 2020, the Portland City Council adopted anti-racism and equity as two of the city's core values. And whereas the city of Portland has continued to honor the significant contributions of the Asian American community and stress the importance of responding to anti-Asian bias through participation in the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, the Asian American and Pacific Islander Day Against Bullying and Hate, and the Oregon Rises Above Hate Coalition celebrations. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, the City of Roses, do hereby celebrate Sean Milligan's courage. Thank you from all of us. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for letting us embarrass you a bit, too. <laughs> but you earned it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Natasha. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. This is the Wednesday, September 20th afternoon session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, good afternoon. Please call the roll. Good afternoon. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Here. Wheeler. Here. Now we're going to hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov backslash council backslash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct, such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliber deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you very much. First up today, first time certain, 797. It's a non-emergency ordinance. Amend Council Organization and Procedures Code to align with the amended City Charter approved by voters in Portland Measure 26-228. Colleagues, today we're considering changes to the City Code Chapter 3.02, which governs City Council Organization and Procedure. This proposal aligns the City's code 
with charter amendments passed by voters last November and provides the basic framework for the operations of the next City Council. The transition team is with us today to discuss the proposed changes and a phased approach for alignment. I want to thank the team, in particular Tate White, who's with us here to present today, as well as, of course, our City Attorney's Office, the Auditor's Office, and the Council Clerk, and indeed members of my own staff who've worked hard to think this through. Before I turn it over to Tate, I want to address a question I've heard about this topic and one that we may hear about in public testimony, which is, why make these changes now? Why not let the next council set up their own procedures? It's a fair question. I want the next mayor and the city council to have a turnkey structure that enables them to hit the ground running. When the new council takes office, these changes will provide the basic framework needed for them to hold their first meeting and elect a council president and a vice president. These changes also allow folks who are considering running for council next year to have a better understanding of how council would function, how frequently they would meet, and how <laughs> items get to council in the first place. These changes would not go into effect until January 1st, 2025, <coughs> and the next council, and this is important, they are free to change these rules as they see fit. These changes act as a starting point for council to conduct business from day one. With that, I'll turn this over to Tate for this afternoon's presentation. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good afternoon, commissioners. Just give me a moment to share my screen, my presentation. <coughs> All right, thank you for your patience. So today, as, as Ms. The, the mayor just explained, we are here to present a first reading of an ordinance to amend city code chapter 3.02 on council organization and procedure. I will present for about 20 minutes in the interest of transparency. And so I ask if you don't mind, please hold any questions until I'm done presenting. Um, adoption of this ordinance will set the foundation for the 12 person council to operate successfully starting in January, 2025. Many people internal and external to the city have contributed to these code amendments, including Lindley Reese and Maya Heim from the city attorney's office, auditor's office council, Lisa Howley and council clerk, Keelan McClemont, Shoshana Oppenheim, and Diana Shiplett from the transition team, and others that I regret not to be able to name individually, including various GTAC members. Thank you all for your contributions. As you know, last November, Portlanders voted to change city government in three significant ways. First, allowing voters to rank candidates in order of preference using rank choice voting. Second, creating four new geographic districts with three members elected to represent each district, expanding the city council to 12 members. And third, replacing the commission form of government with a mayor council form. The city council will focus on setting policy and a mayor elected citywide will run day-to-day -day operations with the help of a professional city administrator. Our understanding is that voters approve these charter amendments to make Portland's government more accountable, transparent, responsive, and representative of every area of the city. Clear roles and responsibilities at the leadership level will help promote these outcomes. Our team is currently working to plan for and provide the structural policy and process changes required to align with these new roles and set the 2025 leadership up for success, but also set you up for success through this transition. The code chapter updates we are speaking about today are a foundational piece of this work. So for those who have been less involved in this process, I will be referencing city charter, the city charter and, the, and city code throughout my presentation. And so to help onboard us, I'm gonna define the differences between these terms. The city's charter functions as the city's constitution, and the city's code sets rules for the city of Portland and the public. 
Today, Portland has 34 chapters of city code that need to be updated as we look forward to 2025. Let's also revisit why code revisions are needed now. Code chapter 3.02 revisions are needed to give the 12-member district-based council the structure and guidelines to operate effectively beginning January 1st, 2025. Clarity about the roles and responsibilities of council and the mayor, as well as the city administrator, are needed now to help city staff, the public, and interested candidates prepare for the mayor-council form of government that will start in 2025. These code revisions also provide clarity to what interested candidates are signing up for, as well as a foundation for other transition planning decisions. Additional recommendations will continue to be discussed and informed by the community and can be deliberated upon by the 2025 City Council. So in support of providing more clarity on these shifting roles, let's talk about what will be different under the new mayor council form of government. City councilors will no longer directly oversee city bureaus and will focus on setting policies to achieve desired community outcomes. Councilors will be elected by district and not citywide. The mayor will no longer sit on council and unlike councilors will be elected citywide. Future mayors will appoint and council will confirm a professional city administrator. The mayor and city administrator will work together to implement the laws and policies developed by council and will manage all city bureaus. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison of how the roles of council and the mayor will be different. Council will set policy while the mayor will manage city services Councilors will develop standards that establish the parameters for running Portland's government. This work will include making appropriations, raising revenues, and approving or adjusting the city's budget. The mayor and city administrator will oversee bureaus, employees, facilities, and resources. Ensuring funds are being used effectively and in accordance with the budget. Council will hold public meetings, gather input, debate, evaluate policy choices, and adopt laws to reflect their choices. The mayor will have the same authority as other councilors to introduce matters before council. The mayor will vote in the case of a tie. Finally, council will have quasi-judicial power to apply laws and policies. We have approached this particular code chapter work in two phases. This year's update is represented by phase one and focused on matching code chapter 3.02 with the amended city charter and ensuring the 2025 city council can hold its first meeting, elect its first council president and start operating in 2025. The second phase of this work is to identify, research and provide recommendations for additional council process improvements procedures or organizational structures for the 2025 City Council to consider, especially when it comes to council committees. Further engagement on additional code chapter revisions and phase two recommendations will happen in 2024. This slide shows our 2023 timeline. You can see an overview of meetings we have had with internal subject matter experts, commissioner offices, and the Government Transition Advisory Committee to inform policy choices for this code update. On August 8th, we held a community listening session to present our work to date, answer questions, and take feedback. A public comment period preceded this listening session. We followed up with the Government Transition Advisory Committee to discuss what we heard and have incorporated this feedback where possible into the proposed revised code you see today. This feedback will also inform phase two. The proposed amended code you see today is not a redline version of the current code 3.02 because it has been reorganized to eliminate redundancies and promote clarity and accessibility. Despite this intentional reorganization, the amended code does not differ drastically from the city code that Portland councils have been using for decades. Robert's rules of order is still proposed to continue to be used to resolve procedural questions that are not covered by this code. 
The primary amendments to the code are in response to the charter amendments that expand city council to 12 members, establish district-based councilors, and shift the focus of city council to being a legislative and quasi-judicial body. We previously engaged you on key policy choices related to these changes, which I will revisit now. These policy choices relate to the role of council president, the council meeting schedule, clarifying vote requirements that are not defined in the charter for the 12 member council and council meeting management. The new city charter requires that a council president be elected at the first meeting of the year and that they preside over council meetings. However, the charter doesn't outline any other duties for the council president as, in, as is common in, more, in other cities with mayor council forms of government. By charter, the city auditor is required to produce an agenda for all council meetings. Our recommendation is that the council president work with the city auditor to finalize the meeting agenda, including reviewing all items and recommending whether the item should be com considered immediately by the full council or referred to a committee. This ensures that the city auditor has one point of contact for city council agenda issues rather than 12. This duty is outlined in the code and an additional clause was added to balance this power across the council. The addition includes a reference to standing first agenda item at council meetings with approval of the agenda in its order with a vote of the full council. Any new agenda items can be added to the following meeting's agenda. The council president would also assign seats at the dais and sign items approved by council when necessary. Having the president take on these responsibilities ensures that there is accountability and a clear decision maker for core operational needs. The president's proposed role as a primary point of contact between the mayor and the city council was codified in the public review draft of the code, but it has since been removed due to express concerns about this potentially limiting communications between other councilors and the mayor. We still recommend communications from the executive to the entirety of council be funneled through the council president, but this is something that can be explored further without being codified at this time. We recommend that the full council make decisions around committees such as what committees should be created and who should be appointed to them. Having council make these decisions both helps councilors to develop working relationships across districts and ensures that a majority of councilors are involved in determining policy priorities. After an item has been referred to a committee, seven councilors can vote to withdraw the item and return it to the full council for consideration. We felt this balance of power was particularly important given the council president will be elected from a district and not citywide. In considering council's new legislative role and the anticipated addition of frequent committee meetings, we explored if the regular council meeting schedule needs to be altered. Currently, the city council meets every Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. and as necessary Wednesday and Thursday afternoons. The 2025 council will be largely new and need to meet in full to develop good working relationships and a shared understanding of their roles as counselors. In the first six months of their term, the 2025 counselors will need to work together to complete the first budget process in the new form of government. They will also need to work together to establish policy priorities and the smaller committees that will focus on those areas. Therefore, we are proposing establishing a minimum number of meetings per month for council with the understanding that they can meet more frequently if necessary. We are recommending at least one of these meetings be required to be at night since evening meetings increase accessibility and equity of access to council for community members that work during the day. It will be important for the schedule of council meetings to allow for the timely flow of legislation between council and committees and increase public engagement. So we recommend the future council track the effectiveness of the cadence of their full and committee meetings and consider making any necessary adjustments to the schedule. The third major policy choice relates to voting requirements for council decisions. 
The charter explicitly outlines many council voting requirements, which can be seen on the slide. We cannot change these requirements without a charter amendment approved by Portland voters. However, there are a few vote requirements tied to council actions which are not set by charter. But we recommend be clearly identified so council can do its business effectively. This slide shows the council actions and vote thresholds we are recommending in the amended code chapter 3.02 so council, staff, and community members understand what votes are required for common council actions. For any actions not defined in chapter 3.02, the council would use Robert, Robert's rules of newly, excuse me, Robert's rules of order newly revised, which is standard practice for most cities across the country. We received public comments questioning the reasoning for giving the mayor, with the support of six councilors, the ability to call a special meeting, with some expressing concern about maintaining separation of powers between the legislative and executive branches. This ability was originally written in decode in response to internal feedback about the need for the mayor and city administrator to have the ability to bring time-sensitive items to council's attention. In response to public feedback, the language has been edited to emphasize the need for written consent of six counselors for the mayor to be able to call a special meeting. Several public comments recommended adding a defined process to remove the council president and vice president during their terms. So wording has been added to allow for the removal of the president or vice president by the affirmative vote of a supermajority of nine members. The final major policy choices made for the draft chapter relate to how council meetings are managed. As we have discussed, many new councilors will begin office for the first time ever and under a new form of government. Having some basic structure and rules of procedure in place will support council's success, particularly in the first few meetings as councilors learn about their meeting processes and requirements. On the slide, you can see three fundamental council actions we identified as helpful to define and code and provide a framework under which council can operate. Although once elected, the council president will preside over council, it is not clear who will preside in advance of that crucial vote at the first meeting. We are proposing that the council clerk, with assistance of legal counsel, act as presiding officer until the council president and vice president are elected. Currently, voting order goes by commissioner number, rotated quarterly with the mayor always voting last. Since we will have 12 councilors elected from four districts, voting order gets a little more complicated. We are recommending that votes be called by district in numerical order and by alphabetical order of last names of councilors in those districts. Each quarter, the beginning district is rotated to the end, and the presiding officer, typically the council president or vice president, will vote last. Finally, as touched on previously, to balance the council president's role in helping to finalize the agenda with the city auditor, we are recommending that a majority present approve the agenda at the start of the meeting. The majority may agree to reorder the agenda or add an item to the next meeting's agenda. And finally, here are a few of the topics we see as potential priorities for additional research and community input over 2024 to inform these phase two recommendations. Committee meeting rules and procedures will be a huge focus for additional recommendations to the 2025 City Council. Through this process, we will also explore potential updates to rules around public testimony and the full council meeting cycle and how the addition of committee meetings may change these considerations. Committees provide the opportunity for increased public engagement with city council, but no final votes will be taken at committee meetings. Public hearings will continue to happen at full council meetings. We will be thinking more about how work sessions may best be used through the transition and into the future. 
We've already been thinking about how the mayor will be interfacing with city council in the new form of government, but we'll continue to do so with the objective of promoting collaboration between the executive and the legislative branches, which has been expressed as a community priority. So this concludes my formal presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Our next step is that the council set vote next week, and we ask for your support to adopt these changes to City Code Chapter 3.02 to help set the 2025 City Council up for success and enable us to continue implementation of the charter amendments. You learned about the topics we want to dig into deeper through phase two on the previous slide, which we will continue to align with other related work, including planning for onboarding of the city councilors and mayor that will be elected in November of 2024. I'm, I'm joined by Senior Deputy City Attorney Maya Heim, and we are happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, do you have questions you want to ask now? Uh, before we get to public testimony, we can do public testimony first, whatever people prefer. Uh, Keelan, how many folks do we have signed up? We have one person signed up. All right, well, that's an easy one. Let's let's go ahead and take our, our one brave soul. Three minutes, please, name for the record. Terry Harris is joining us online. Welcome. Hi, Terry. Terry, you're good to go. Uh, you're muted. Thanks, just got here. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, I'm Terry Harris. I'm an alternate member to GTAC, but I'm testifying here today in my personal capacity. Um, I understand that the transition to a new government under the voter approved charter amendments is an extremely difficult task in an extremely short period of time. Nevertheless, I'm testifying essentially to ask the council whether this particular ordinance is necessary or ready to adopt at this particular moment. As everyone knows here, the fundamental nature of the city council changes in January 25. The idea behind the charter amendments and the intent of voters was to create an expanded legislative council dealing in policy making, not policy executing. It's obvious that the code governing the council needs to adapt to this new purpose. My concern is that the code you're adopting here is not that code. These are retrofit edits to the current code that are probably minimally sufficient for alignment with the charter, but are gonna fall far short of what's actually gonna be necessary. This is not the basic structure the new council um, will need as the intent of this um, ordinance is supposed to be. As I wrote in comments to staff, six of the seven sections of this draft are going to have to be rewritten to accommodate more robust committee procedures, committee procedures that will be necessary on day one for an expanded legislative council. All of Portland's peer cities have committees. A much bigger council is going to need committees, and our code needs to handle committees. Now, sure, there are further refinements to operations and procedures beyond committees, which might be less left, best left to phase two for the new council to adopt. What a council agenda looks like and how a council meeting is organized in 2025 is almost certainly not gonna be the same as today's. But the basic common legislative infrastructure the council will need should be in place. Adopting the basics like committees incrementally is gonna require this council and the next council to do extra work. So my suggestion to this council would be to set this draft aside, direct staff to provide you with a more mature draft before you consider adoption. In particular, a draft that provides for how standing and special committee, how standing and special committees are organized and operated, how committee work flows from and through the council and clear contours for the roles and responsibilities of the council president and council committee chairs in a new committee system. It's not rocket science. There are decades of experience in legislatures across the country. These fundamentals of legis legislative procedures are well understood. And there are many familiar examples to work from. Oregon legislature is one model. 
that many people will immediately understand, except for maybe the Senate's quorum. But I just think to, to wrap up my three minutes um, after a 20 minute discussion, I just think that doing the detailed code work more holistically will be important for council candidates to understand the environment in which new legislative and oversight res responsibilities will function and for voters to develop fundamentally new expectations for their elected leadership. Thank you, and I can answer any questions. Thank you, Terry. Commissioner Mapps. Um, I wanna thank staff for that presentation. I just have a couple of quick questions uh, about uh, aspects of the proposed code which I don't quite understand. Uh, for example, um, uh, in the draft code, um, there's a section about motion for reconsideration. I'm not, uh, can someone explain to me how that works? Yeah, so if there was a, a vote and then um, somebody could, one of the counselors could immediately ask for a motion to reconsider the vote. It's very rarely used. Let, 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 me, let me give a, a concrete example, because we've, we've had, you know, I've, I've been here seven years and I think I have voted for probably four reconsiderations, it's fairly rare. Uh, the context in which we currently use it most often is if we bring something to a vote and it's an emergency ordinance, if somebody votes no, then the ordinance is dead. Mm. Unless, and it's usually me as the last vote, yeah. uh, but whoever is the last vote, in this case the presiding officer, I would vote with the majority. The majority would be the one person <laughs> who voted no. So even though if I support the ordinance, let's say I support it and Commissioner Rubio votes no. Right. Um, I would then vote no, even though I like the ordinance, for the purpose of reconsideration. And we just won, even though we're not the majority of the council, but we're the majority from the perspective of the rules, meaning we won the vote by killing it. Now, because I voted with the majority, I have the right to ask for reconsideration of the vote. And so then I would move at that point. I don't know if we've done it with, with this council recently, but I'd vote for a reconsideration. I'd move, and then I'd get a second, and usually as a courtesy, a second is extended, and then a majority can bring it back for a vote. And usually what happens at that point is I would request a removal of the emergency clause. And usually everybody agrees to that and moves to second reading with the one commissioner having registered their public objection. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, that's helpful. I think we have done this once or twice uh, since we've been here. Um, and frankly, I've never quite tracked the details. So could anyone on council, under our current rules, can anyone on council do that maneuver? Or is so. it reserved for the mayor? Anyone can do it, although it is easier for the person who votes last because then they've got the tally of the votes. But anyone can do it. Okay, uh, that's helpful. I'll have to go study harder. Um, another just quick question on something which I just authentically wasn't quite clear on. Um, can we pull up slide 12? Mm -hmm. One moment, I have to share it again. Okay, uh, we're all familiar, I'm looking at the uh, row dealing with emergency ordinances. I'm trying to develop an intuitive understanding of includes ordinances for franchises. What's the sort of intuitive? I might have to turn it to my head again. <laughs> yeah, in our current charter, we have a very, um, what I would describe, I think accurately, as a torturous process for franchise ordinances. Those requirements will be on the ballot in November 2024. They were advanced by the Charter Commission for a simple majority rather than a super majority. Um, so if that ballot measure passes, then it would not be, that, that need to have a, a very specific vote count for franchises would no longer exist, but that's why you see it there now. Okay. Simply a quirk of the existing charter. I appreciate the explanation. Uh, I won't belabor the point. I still don't quite understand, but I'll uh, <laughs> I'll get 
I'll get briefed um, um, at a later date. Um, uh, th I think this is an easy question. Um, what's the sort of organic term for the council president? Is that, or how long is it the term for a council president? Sorry, how long is the term? It's a year. A year, so okay. So that's in charter that the vote for the council president at the first meeting every new year. Um, great, and I'll wrap up in all likelihood uh, by a comment which builds off of uh, some of the thoughts shared by uh, public testimony, which deals with this whole committee space, uh, which I I think is interesting, and there I would imagine we could build a stack of ARs uh, or whatever you would be the appropriate rules there that are three inches thick. Um, so, well, I'll just express my interest in learning more about how uh, committees work. I'll tell you the other thing, uh, especially as we begin to talk about um, uh, committees, I do wonder if there's going to be staff which are spe committee specific. And here I'm kind of thinking about legislatures, like in Congress and state legislatures, I think we see that fairly often. We haven't heard a lot about that. This also, I think, gestures towards um, this broader project that we're working on. Uh, I think all of the offices are working really hard to uh, come up with our best thoughts on the proper organizational chart for uh, the council moving forward, as in which service areas there are, what goes in, into what. Um, one of the things that so far has been largely absent from that conversation is the implied staffing patterns that will exist within that. Um, and I think that, you know, I think we've talked about that at the sort of bureau level and service area level, but I think the committee, uh, I, I think what's probably going to happen is council will the future councils will find that they want to have staff that are unique to specific bureaus, but uh, I'm not quite sure. I just look forward to hearing more about what um, staff's recommendations are for that space. Thank you for that. Um, as you know, there was a budget note in the mayor's proposed, um, you know, asking the transition team to work on staffing planning to support the new elected officials. So we have been doing that work. Okay. We've been mapping out um, the different services required to support council today, but then also anticipated new services in the new form of government, which largely does involve supporting committee work and legislative work. So we have been doing that work. We are working on delivering a cost neutral option and and cost we will have option. alternatives as well. Okay, great. And uh, just to really put my cards on the table, at least my understanding of where we are in uh, the charter reform process is we're trying to figure out an org chart. Uh, we need that org chart fairly soon because we're gonna be budgeting into this org chart. Uh, but one of the things that uh, is currently absent from the org charts discussion that we've had so far is what staffing uh, patterns are implied by that. Uh, now, if this is going to be budget neutral, um, I think that's I think that's going to be challenging. I, I, I don't know, for example, if we have staff for committees, we, I think we have to stop, we have to repurpose some bodies uh, uh, um, in the system. But I'll, I'll pause there and let uh, my colleagues uh, pose some questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gonzalez. I think um, one of the questions I'm wrestling with hearing from cities that have recently expanded their council mm -hmm. on the question of communication between uh, council members and the mayor, that is actually a really challenging and sometimes vexing problem that's not that intuitive to us because the mayor can literally meet with each of us in a given week. It, sometimes it's hard to schedule that, but it's not impossible. <laughs> But given 12, um, you know, I've heard from folks even when they have eight, that's a, it's not easy uh, to have a regular cadence. And so um, I appreciate the public comment on that comment, uh, on that area. Um, I'm just sharing from folks who've gone through this recently uh, that, this is, that it, this is not an easy problem to solve. I mean, maybe you could do you know, cover two districts per week, or, uh, I, you know, you can think of ways to try and streamline that, because one advantage the new council will have, you're not, you're not triggering public meeting laws by meeting with more than one folk, uh, one, more than one council member at a time, so it, you know, they're going to have some more flexibility than we do in that respect, to have multiple folks in the same meeting, but 
I think this is this is going to be a challenge, and I'm I'm just hearing this from folks who've recently gone through it. So, mm -hmm. I I don't know if you lean on the council president to be that more you know to have that role more explicitly as you originally proposed, but I. Yeah. I think we need to take that into account. Again, that's for the new council and the mayor to figure out, but it's it's hearing from folks, it's not that easy. On council formation, could you go back to the slide where you show council formation? Sorry, council. Well, you had the line items uh, articulating what the council president's responsibility would be. Oh, it's this one. Right. Yeah, this one. Yeah. So the, you're proposing when I'm looking down at the creation, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time reading on my screen. So the, how will committees be generated based on this? Is it gonna be from the entire council will uh, approve and potentially eliminate count, uh, uh, committees? Yes, currently we're leaving it to the full council to decide upon committees. It actually is in our draft code how that process will happen. They will decide upon, you know, the committee topic and the membership as as a council. I think it's um, a vote of seven, and I'm getting confirmation from the deputy city attorney, and we want to leave more space to discuss that. And so we're adopting kind of core um, core decisions within this, this code chapter, but leaving some flexibility co to continue to have those conversations in phase two about committees. And is there any explicit delegation to committees in the existing code? Um, or is it, I mean, or is it essentially advisory? I mean, what's a, what, how would you describe the committee's authority at, out of the gate. It, which is also outlined in the in the proposed code. They are considered advisory to council. Okay. And so that's why we talked about um, the full council makes final decisions. Public hearings happen at council. As we see in other cities, often committees make recommendations to the full council. Well, I mean, I'm just envisioning committees would become more functional experts on no. their area and um, I, I'm perfectly fine punting to the new council to figure that out, but they they will likely become subject matter expert, experts, hopefully in the in, in those areas. And so, um, I think intuitively I'd be supportive of some level of delegation of those committees. But again, I'm okay with keeping that. Let the next council figure that out. I think the public comment was getting at that a little bit. Okay. Um, well one last approve or amend agenda. Now, that's kind of a standard uh, Robert's rule of order type provision, I think. Mm -hmm. Is that what is that why it's included? Because I mean, I, I don't know, I've only been here for eight months, but that's not really seen us amend the agenda at the beginning. We sometimes do it on the fly. But um, could you just why is that just we're, we're trying to map to Robert's rules of order there? Or I what problem are we trying to solve there? I will say briefly, it is partially to balance the power and not give too much power to a council <laughs> president that is elected by a district. But my, my I, Yeah, I think that's correct. We wanted an efficient process, um, but we also were recognizing that the, the new council president will come from one district and wanted the full council to be able to weigh in. If they really wanted to hear an item immediately, um, then that would be certainly an option that they could override the council president's decision to delay or move it to committee. But moving to committee in this case, as of right now, is not an explicit delegation of any authority, right? So that's a... Well, well currently there are no council committees. committees. Right. I'm just, I mean, the, the prospect of referring something to committee is sort of a, what does it really mean if you're not delegating any authority to it? I mean, it, it, other than delaying... Well, I mean, if, if the full council wanted to hear an item rather than send it to committee, they would have the option to vote. And if a majority voted to, for the full council to hear that item immediately, they would be able to do that and override the council's president, the council president's decision to move it to committee. Okay. Okay. Uh, I mean, certainly, I think that this new council is going to want to figure this stuff out. So we're trying to give them a, a framework to start with. Um, I guess the last point on on committees is that I think once we do iron out you know, our recommendations on, for the organization of the administrative side, that that might be a reasonable starting point 
uh, for committee organization at, on the legislative side, I can already envision where you wouldn't map uh, 100%, but that it's kind of a reasonable starting point. So um, I don't know if we should leave 2024 with some recommendations on committee organization. I, I don't think we need to put it in the code, I think, but I, I do want to circle back to that, that we give them a framework to start with. And again, they have full ability to throw it out if they don't like it, but it just uh, to give some structure. Uh, I'll stop with that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rubio. Hi. Um, hi, Tate. I, hi. I just have some quick questions about public engagement and just a few things, um, a few detailed questions about access to policy development through the committee. Um, and first, I just want to say thanks so much for our meetings with your office have been great, and you've been really great at listening to us and incorporating ideas and talking through ideas. So thank you for that. My pleasure. Um, so uh, first is the consent. Is that going to stay the same, the way that the, we do consent now? What's different in the new policy or the council meeting? The cons consent agendas you're referring to? Yeah. I believe it's rather similar. I'll yeah, it'll be almost identical. The um, we can't. Anyone will be able to remove that, and that's a charter um, right. requirement. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I suspect will be different is you'll see much um, less contracts. Okay. Um, that will move to become an executive function. So council will hopefully be really focused on policy and legislation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That that was my question about still being able to pull things from consent. Um, and then council communication, will that stay the same, or will that be expanded for more of the public to access and be able to test sign up for? That's a great Brilliant. comment. Currently, we have kept it the same, but that's something we really want to leave, or that's something we really want to talk to the community more through phase two. We see committees, which will be public meetings, those committee meetings as an opportunity for, for more interface with the public, with council. And so that's, we're going to explore, you know, with, with the Government Transition Advisory Committee and other community members what are the different options for that and what are the desires for that before we make any decisions on changes on full, at full council meetings? Okay, and that was my follow-up question to that was about um, testimony in committee and because I just heard you say that that you're still planning to have hearings, like full hearings at council. So are you taking test any testimony at committee level? And mm -hmm. I, I'm hearing you say there's an interplay then for public testimony sign up at the regular with the committee testimony. So can you just give me your ideas about what you're thinking? Well, honestly, that's exactly what we want to work out. Okay. But we're, we're, we're not taking away anything that we have currently. Mm -hmm. If anything, it will be additive right. as we figure that out okay. through our expanded conversations with the community yeah, and, and different, different subject context. matter experts. Right. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. We don't need committees Thank the same you. way. They're going to want committees. Thank you, because Commissioner. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Good to see you, Tate. Great work. Um, Commissioner Rubio uh, asked about consent, so thank you. Some great questions. Uh, so these are like our bylaws that we're putting together. That's what it feels like. Um, and there's a lot here. So uh, we start to ask, uh, there's some big picture questions. One is, you know, we're reminded that the council, the city council will be all about policy. Mm -hmm. um, my through line to implementation, because when you look at the state, county, metro, every form of government, we're not, uh, we're good at doing policy work. We pass, we, ask, we pass a lot of policy, we don't implement a lot of it. Mm. So where's the council's responsibility um, to be accountable to implementation of policy? How does that connect? Is it all going to be on the mayor and the, the city manager? Okay. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh. Are you ready for me to answer? Oh, totally, yeah, stop me. <laughs> I'm just listening. Um, I, I think that's exactly what we're thinking about. You heard me mention, we're thinking about how do we maintain the desired separation between the executive and legislative, but also promote collaboration and promote that feedback loop that really gets to the responsive and accountable government that Portlanders are looking for. 
And so we've been thinking about in our staffing planning and everything, what are the communication channels that promote this culture of collaboration? And I think you know, in the charter, there are established times for, for the mayor and the city administrator to provide updates to council in public meetings. And I think we can build from there. And so I, that's our continued conversation over the next year, I think. And then that icon that you have under council president to serve as a primary contact between mayor and council, why don't I know what that means? Well, I could have a used really a dense. better one. It's just a, it's a little icon to, to simulate conversation. Okay, and the we're fact, all thinking about it, that. It used to be a check mark when we had it codified, yeah. but when we were responding to public feedback that like, oh, we're worried that means the rest of council won't talk to the mayor. We're like, okay, we get that. Let's, we'll pull that back now and continue to have conversation about what that Thank means. Thank you for explaining that nuance. Yeah. I might have made up a different story and it wouldn't have been helpful. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do believe the dialogue we're having right now, though, is a big one because yeah. my experience, again, is that um, governments have a hard time implementing policy. Mm. And so how we really make sure that we operationalize that function mm -hmm. will be important. You, we started talking about staffing just a little bit. And uh, is we've heard I think more rumors and we've seen facts written down about staffing models, but is the council president, is our conversations about the council president with all these responsibilities having more staff than the rest of the council members? Mm -hmm. You know, um, the salary commission, you know, questioned that a little bit and thinking if the council president should have a higher salary. And through our research of other cities, it was not common for the council president to have a higher salary, but it was common for them to have more staff support. That would so be that my is something good. we are thinking about through that services catalog that I talked about and making sure the appropriate levels of services are met for, for each. Okay. Just a couple questions. Thanks. Thank you. Very good. Uh, colleagues, anything else before we move this to second? Uh, Tate, thank you. I want to thank you for your hard work on this. And I, I know Maya put a lot of work into this. Uh, Lindley Reese, who could not be here today, put many hours into drafting these changes. And I'd be very remiss if I didn't acknowledge her terrific work and our, our legal team's work on this. Colleagues, obviously, there'll be more code changes coming our way in the months ahead as we prepare for this new form of government. But I thought this was a great conversation today, and I appreciate everybody's input. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Next item, 798, please, non-emergency non ordinance. Adopt the Portland Clean Energy Community Benefits Fund Climate Investment Plan in effect through October 31st, 2028. Colleagues, our next item is to consider the Portland Clean Energy Community Benefits Fund five-year climate investment plan, sometimes called the CIP. I'm now going to pass it to Commissioner in charge of planning and sustainability. That is, of course, Commissioner Rubio, who will introduce the item. Commissioner. Thank you, Mayor. Colleagues, I'm excited to present an ambitious climate investment plan that represents $750 million in community-led clean energy projects and climate investments over the next five years. This plan represents thousands of hours of engagement by numerous stakeholders and sectors and prioritizes programs that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and strengthens the communities that are hit first and hardest by extreme climate events. The Climate Investment Plan, or CIP, was recommended by the Portland Clean Energy Community Benefit Fund Committee and, as mentioned, shaped by extensive input and engagement from community, nonprofits, and public and private partners. PSEF, which got its start from the community, passed with overwhelming support. It's the first environmental initiative led by communities of color in Oregon and the first program of its kind in the United States. This fund is designed to reduce and remove the systemic barriers that have accompanied our dependence on fossil fuels while centering frontline and BIPOC communities as decision makers. As we hear this presentation today, after a summer with intense heat waves, we are reminded of the significance and the potential of this program and the highly impactful and consequential investments we can deliver to our communities as we face unprecedented climate disasters. 
The need to address the climate crisis cannot be any clearer. You just need to look at our news on any given day. Over the past several years, Portlanders have increasingly experienced re record shattering heat, um, choking smoke from increasing wildfires, floods, and other extreme climate events. Scientists also recently published a warning that the next five summers will be the hottest on record. In fact, Earth is likely to pass 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming over pre-industrial level, levels, a key climate threshold by 2027. The importance is urgency. Human-caused climate change is making our weather more erratic and unpredictable and, ex and at times extremely hot or snowy or windy and lives are increasingly at stake, and these have real life safety impacts on Portlanders. This is why we have urgency in building a sustainable and climate resilient city for future generations, especially those impacted first and disproportionately. Since the first RFP in April of 21, we have gained valuable insights, and, according to the, and, and accordingly, the PSEF program has evolved. This process led council action led to a council action in October 2022 to make adjustments that allow for a more responsive program that retains the commitment of the original ballot measure but allows for more agile and aggressive investments in our climate action efforts. And today I'm proud to introduce the climate investment plan that outlines strategies and outcomes for a 70, 750 million investment from 2023 through 2028. This CIP reflects real and transformational opportunities ahead. So now I'd like to pass it to Director Donnie Oliveira to kick off today's presentation um, on the Climate Investment Plan along with Director Sam Barrasso. Uh, before they jump in, Commissioner, could, could I also just as a point of order, um, could, could we do the staff presentation, the invited testimony subsequent to that, and then I know we have a lot of people signed up for public testimony. Could we take our 10 minute break prior to the public testimony? Because we'll be about two hours sure. into the council session, and I want to make sure we give our, our folks upstairs uh, a, a little bit of a break. Does, okay. is, is that acceptable, yeah. everybody? Good. Yeah. So we'll, we'll hear your presentation, invited testimony, then we'll just take a 10 minute recess, and then we'll come back to hear everybody else. Sounds great. Thank Thanks, you, Donna. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, no problem. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Council, for the record, my name is Donnie Oliveira. I'm the director for the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Uh, so it's a real pre uh, privilege and honor to be up here uh, to present to you um, the first ever climate investment plan for the city of Portland that will serve as the foundation for $750 million into climate benefits for our community over the next five years. Next slide, please. So here's the, the agenda. We'll just, I'm going to walk through this briefly and then dive right in. So we're going to provide a high-level overview of the program, um, its connection to our climates, uh, climate goals for the city, um, some information about our decision-making process, um, but we're also going to walk through some of the, the details of the fund itself and the, and the program um, allocations and really walk through the nuts and bolts of how we're going to be moving forward. Um, I want to offer that um, at any point you have questions, please ask what we do um, each, after each section have time um, to answer questions. So either hold for those or ask um, for clarification along the way. Next slide, please. So let's start with um, the program at a glance. I think it's just important to set the foundation of how we got here and how this $750 million is going to advance our climate work. Next slide, please. So you've seen this before, uh, Council, but I want to just walk through because it's important to kind of frame how PISA fits into the larger climate goals, but how it really is um, centering the next um, five years of our work. Um, let's talk about, again, the city of Portland was one of the first um, cities in the country to um, develop a climate um, action plan. That was in 1993. And all along the way, we've been continuing to develop plans that are both data-driven, but informed by the experiences of our communities. Um, What's really been the, the game changer for us is when community um, led a ballot initiative in 2018 uh, to put resources behind those goals and those plans and those visions. And what's important to think about as well is we are now in the climate crisis. When you look back to 1993 and in 2001, we were talking about a future um, climate impacted scenario. Well, now we are in those scenarios. So now as we look at our mitigation targets and our mitigation strategies, we're also ensuring that we're doing things that are going to provide resilient um, frameworks and investments for our communities as well, especially those that have been historically harmed by a climate, um, but all, also those who have experienced um, a lack of seat at the table in terms of decision making and the lack of opportunity to invest and be a part of the, the wealth generating opportunities of our fine city. Next slide, please. 
Uh, one of the most consistent um, questions we get about PCEF is how it ties into our climate emergency work plan. So two summers ago, uh, this council adopted a climate emergency um, and we came back with a work plan that outlined um, several objectives that our city bureaus and partners are, are in, uh, engaged in to reduce our climate emissions um, to net zero. Um, what the climate emergency work plan lays out is um, some distinct buckets of reduction scenarios and strategies, including resilience. And what the climate investment plan does is it really aligns with those goals, but it was never intended to be the funding source for every single objective in the climate emergency work plan. So to be clear, the climate investment plan is, is, has direct nexus with the work plan, but it is not the sole investment strategy for all those objectives in the city's overall climate emergency work plan. And what's important about that is to say we have a lot of work to do within PCEF and the fund itself, but there is so much more we have to do working with within our bureaus, within our um, private sector partners to reach um, our goals. Um, the other thing I want to acknowledge is $750 is a substantial amount of resources to invest in climate. It's a very big deal, but it is still relatively a drop in the bucket for the full investment necessary to truly meet our climate goals and to maintain um, a resilient like, framework for our communities. Um, if you think about it on scale, next slide please. We'd be looking at um, a minimum of about $50 billion of investments necessary to actually uh, meet all the climate resilience and mitigation goals that we've set forth. And that's, those aren't nice to have. We're talking about uh, infrastructure investments. We're talking about uh, mode shift. We're talking about the grid uh, transformation that we um, spoke with you all about earlier this month when it comes to uh, increasing our transmission and distribution um, infrastructure. As we shift to electrification, we need to ensure that we have resilience in our grid. So all those investments are upwards of $50 billion. $750 million is still a lot. I, can't, I don't want to underscore um, how significant that is, um, but I do want to acknowledge that it's, it's still a, a portion of the way we have to go as, as a city. Um, the last thing I want to acknowledge here is that uh, the $750 million of projects that are in the plan are based on community benefits, the ability for those to reduce emissions. They're really important goals, and yet we still have a lot more to do, both from city leadership, um, city bureaus, and from our partners in the community. Next slide, please. All right, so another piece of feedback we heard was we want to make sure um, there's clarity about the sequence of events and the role that council will play in terms of the next steps of this fund. Uh, first and foremost, um, uh, this is a major step in the fund's um, history. This is a chance for you all to uh, give us the authority to start um, investing more substantially in our communities for climate action. Um, but this is not the only time we'll be coming back to this council for um, uh, action. So we will be releasing a long overdue um, RFP number three this fall. So this will be the next chance for us to reach out to communities and ask for projects to fund. Uh, council will be here to authorize that allocation. Um, and then we will start to um, produce agreements with external partners, um, such as um, school districts, um, with other private investment partners, will look to come to council to authorize those contracts. So you might see, uh, for example, uh, a climate-friendly schools program, uh, energy agency agreement sometime in early 2024, as an example. Um, we'll come back again in the fall, or excuse me, the spring of 2024 with another RFP um, to award those grants. And again, we'll be continuing coming to you all with uh, contracts um, exceeding a million dollars to um, authorize us into partnership. These are all going to be moments we'll be able to give you updates on the status of the fund, but also give you a chance to uh, get uh, behind the curtain on the work that's being done by bureaus um, and our external partners. Next slide, please. Donnie, real quick on the last yeah. one. Yeah. When you mentioned the public schools, <clears throat> that's in conjunction with our school districts? Yes, correct. Because okay, they have much of that in their bond campaigns, or at least PPS does, I think. Uh, I, I don't know that that's part of the bond element, Commissioner, but it, this is distinct within the framework of PCEF, so we have some, um, and, and Sam can walk through some of the examples that those funds could go towards. Okay. Um, but this is particularly a chance for us to work with our school districts, especially those um, that are in severe need of uh, core infrastructure, HVAC um, investments to help um, ensure that our, our, yeah, our schools are able okay, to. Okay, that's been a strong message when PPS passes the bond, <clears throat> but we all know the other school districts east of PPS don't have um, the same privilege. So That's, that's correct. Cool. Um, it's also, while we're here, actually, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge um, that the amount of work that goes into some of these intergovernmental agreements is really substantial. Um, we, uh, a gracious uh, partner in parks, worked with us for an urban forestry um, program that uh, we worked with community partners 
park staff, uh, PSEF staff to come up with an agreement that this was authorized by council in uh, the fall to have one of the first um, strategic initiatives um, greenlit. And the amount of work that we're gonna be doing with the school districts um, and other government partners to help support the investment of these funds is gonna be substantial. And we look forward to working with all of our bureau partners to do that. Not only that, but we continue to ensure that all the programs are community um, centered and that the, the benefits are designed to ensure that the, the people who we're looking to, to support are centered in the decision making and in the implementation of these strategic initiatives that Sam's gonna walk through. I say that to acknowledge that there's an incredible amount of work that's gone into this moment, but an incredible amount of work still necessary to realize the programs and the initiatives that are outlined in the plan. So if there's questions about what it looks like, the, the answer is generally gonna be, we have a lot of work still to do to, um, to deliver on those promises. Any other questions on what I just um, shared? Okay, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Sam to walk through the nuts and bolts of the fund. Okay. <clears throat> Next, Next slide. slide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, uh, commissioners. It's, it's good to be here. This is a lot of work that has gone into this, and so I'm gonna walk you all through that here shortly, and, and you're gonna hear a lot of words from me, so please, we certainly have a moment for questions at the end, but, but I encourage you all to ask questions as we go along. All right, next slide. So I want to just start with just providing a visual diagram of some of the engagement work that happened here. And a big kudos goes to June Reyes, who I think is in the audience today, but uh, is now with the government transition team for architecting and engineering this. So as we went through our nine-month process that got kicked off after council made the code changes back in October of 2022, we had a series of engagement that was designed to really tap into our community's expertise at various different levels. We convened topic area roundtables, about 25 topic area roundtables over a series of meetings that took us through snowstorms and other pieces, but uh, and brought together bureau partners, subject matter experts, uh, grantees that have worked on our projects, and many others. We also engaged through that time period with bureau partners on individual one-on-one -on -one meetings just to tee up those, 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 those roundtables as well as get other information and context as we built out the plan. Through that, we did broader community engagement through virtual Zoom events, online surveys, and in-person workshops hosted throughout the city. And then we hosted uh, and gave updates regularly um, twice a month through both public PCEF committee meetings so folks could track the progress, provide input with the committee, and so we could really right-size, tweak, make adjustments as we went along. And through all that, we were able to really bring folks along through an early kickoff, a visioning stage where folks really guided and, and shared what's the kind of climate resilient Portland they wanted to see in five years. We took that, shaped that through those processes into a preliminary draft that we put out for public comment, received um, comments on that preliminary draft, made adjustments, tweaked that based on the comments, our engagement with our PCF committee, and then released a, a full draft for public comment in May of this year. Afterwards, we did one more, we took that round, worked with our committee as well, worked with subject matter experts to do one more refinement before getting to the plan that's before you all today. Um, and, and as an important note, when we went to council, we said we'd bring this back in nine months and, and the committee made the recommendation exactly nine months after you all um, authorized us to go on this journey of developing this plan. Next slide. Here, I just want to capture some of the, the layers of comments that we got as, as part of the visioning stage. So this was at that higher level. Again, this was where we invited folks to tell us, what's a climate resilient Portland you want to see in the future? We don't want you to, we don't need you to be an expert, but, but share us well, what are the things you wanted to see and received over 400 comments in that stage, brought it into the preliminary draft phase where we really, we surfaced up what came out of our round tables, our expert convenings, our research, and, and, um, and got 500 comments on the preliminary draft and then did some more tweaking and adjustments based on those uh, that draft and release the full draft um, where we got another 130 plus comments. So across this, we've got about a thousand comments informing the plan before you all. Next slide. So in the next few slides, what you're gonna see is different ways of orienting how the funding, the 750 million is being organized. And so in this slide in front of you all here, what you see is our seven funding categories. Now these come directly from our code, and so what you'll see is these are, and, and largely they align with the original ballot measure in most part. About 63% of our funding in the, in the plan goes towards renewable energy and energy efficiency measures. Folks, this is the stuff we've been doing since the Carter administration. It's the stuff we have the most confidence in. Technologies have adjusted and changed, but it's the bread and butter of the work that we do. 
This is getting into homes, buildings, retrofitting our commercial buildings, our schools, and many other places to make sure they're more comfortable environments and, and reducing our energy consumption there. Our next funding category is transportation decarbonization. This was a new funding category that was authorized as part of the code updates. So we did not do this before, but now we do this. And so that's uh, going to be really focused on helping folks move around this community in ways that are more efficient, healthier, and consume less emissions. Next, we've got green infrastructure. Think trees, planting things in soils, sequestering, capturing carbon in the biomass, you know, the roots and, and the trunks and so forth. We've got 5% for our climate jobs, workforce, and contractor development. This is about making sure that we've got the workforce there and the contracting workforce to, to be able to work on these projects and that we're diversifying that workforce. Then 3% for regenerative ag, 2% for capacity building and this other catch-all. Okay, and so just to, before I leave this slide, what I'll say is this largely orients with the original ballot measure. The main changes as part of the code changes is we decreased the funding that went towards our workforce and contractor development, and we substantially increased when we created the transportation decarbonization authorization. We, we increased our funding there. Next slide. This is another way of looking at the 750 million. Originally, our, our focus was on community responsive grants. These are grants for nonprofits to implement projects that are in service to PCEF's mission, reducing emissions and creating that community benefit at the same time. Now, with the code changes, we are enabled to do strategic programs. These are programs that are more directed by the city in service to the community. So it's still fundamentally about emissions reductions and community benefit, but this is based on where it takes a little bit more effort. So these are designed, and you'll see that um, us walk through those programs here shortly. And then we've got our five million set aside for our tree canopy maintenance reserve, and that's distinctly set aside because our code called that out explicitly as, a, as an area. Next slide. This is the last slide breaking down the, the various ways that we're carving out the funds, and so we'll get into the detailed allocations here in a minute. But what this shows here is that across the 750 million, when we think about the city as an implementing partner, there's about 21% of the funds that are set aside directly for city bureaus and entities to administer and, and, and to run. Then we've got about an, an additional 16% where we're going to continue to work with city entities and they will either be eligible to administer those programs or directly receive programs. And we'll talk about what those are here shortly. We've got 20% set aside for community responsive grants. And then we've got 43% set aside for all of those entities that will be largely administered through procurement RFPs. And so these would be open for businesses, private businesses to administer, nonprofit entities and government entities as well. Okay, next slide. So here we're gonna start walking through the actual funding areas and I'll just give a, 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 little, a little example of what each of these are doing. But our first one is 30 million. This is for climate jobs, workforce, and contractor development. This is really broken down into a focus of $4 million focused on youth climate career exposure. So think, really exposing youth, high school youth, into these climate careers so they understand the paths, the, the, the career options that are available ahead of them. This isn't direct job training. The larger source of funds in this allocation, 26 million, is set aside for job training and contractor support. So here we're talking about supporting folks moving into pre-apprenticeship programs and then apprenticeship programs so that they are able to work uh, in, in these various climate careers. It's also about supporting contractor support initiatives. So this would be investing in organizations that support contractors. An example would be taking a painting business and supporting them pivoting into doing some insulation work. Okay, next slide. Now this is our largest funding category. This is renewable energy and energy efficiency. It's that 63% I shared earlier. Our first piece I'll speak to here is our community responsive grants. That is for proposals that are originated from the community. That's what we've done, that's what we'll continue to do. Examples of this are gonna be community solar. It'll be retrofits on a community, on a community building, other projects like that. And then we've got our five strategic programs. Strategic program one, is a program that was fast-tracked as directed by council back in October of 2022. We've been at this directly with the Portland Housing Bureau, and this is focused on clean energy improvements in regulated multifamily affordable housing. 
<coughs> so as we're making the substantial investments in affordable housing as a result of the Portland housing bond, uh, the Metro housing bond and others, we're adding to those projects. And to date, we've already awarded 15 million out of this strategic program through the interagency agreement that we have with Housing Bureau. This is one of two fast track programs in the, in the CIP. The rest is, is here before you for, for, for approval. Next, we've got SP2, Strategic Program 2. This is clean energy in unregulated multifamily housing, sometimes otherwise known as naturally occurring affordable housing. So this is our private market rate affordable housing that is out there that has tremendous amounts of deferred maintenance and need as well. So here we've got 50 million allocated to make energy efficiency, renewable energy improvements, as well as addressing some deferred maintenance that is gonna be key to making those improvements. Next up is SP3, Clean Energy Improvements in Single Family Homes to the tune of 140 million. Here we plan to retrofit on the scale of 600 homes a year or 3,000 homes over five years. We expect to do deep energy retrofits for households earning up to 80% area median income and then lighter and more moderate retrofits for households between 80% median family income and 150% area median income. <coughs> Next up is clean energy in small commercial buildings to the tune of 25 million. This allocation is largely intended to target our smaller commercial buildings that consume quite a bit of energy. So think about your convenience stores that had a lot of refrigeration equipment, restaurant businesses with otherwise hoods and other equipment that's operating that consumes a lot of energy. It's directly focused on supporting making these improvements and addressing um, and, and supporting reducing their operating costs as a part of providing them more efficient equipment. And this program we expect to administer in close collaboration or in discussions with uh, working with Prosper Portland and their storefront improvement program. Um, so this is one where they, we see a lot of alignment opportunities with some other offerings within the city. And then last up in this funding category is strategic program five. This was originally called community resilience hubs. <laughs> It still is that in our minds, but that created a lot of confusion. And so this is building upgrades for communities, severe weather response, that is what we are doing. Folks uh, uh, saw more in community resilience hubs, that's important, but, but not necessarily what we are doing. So here, this is gonna be focused and we expect the city to be a prime entity that we'll be working with here. This is building upgrades where we're gonna be investing in efficient HVAC systems, battery backup systems, solar, other things that are gonna be critical when the grid goes down, when we have wildfire smoke, other things, so that folks have, can have places of refuge that are ADA accessible, seismically resilient, but also are able to operate efficiently and, and operate under when the, when the grid does go down. So we expect this to be, uh, a, a majority of these certainly to be supporting city facilities, but also community facilities as well. Next slide. So now pivoting into um, this next category, and this is a new funding area for the program, is transportation decarbonization. We'd certainly funded some transportation decarbonization in the past, but this is at a, a, a substantially larger scale. Commissioner Gonzalez. Yeah, do you mind going back to the last slide just momentarily? I just want to call out with strategic priority number five, this is an area of extreme concern that you've heard from me. Um, I When we look at holistically the risk that the Portland residents are exposed to uh, over the next 20 years, the next generations, not only are core climate change, heat, uh, extreme weather, heat and cold, but floods and seismic. And um, 30 million is a drop in the bucket, uh, uh, truly over five years. Uh, when I look at the number of activation events we had for cooling and warming centers in our community, uh, to address the unsheltered this year. I think we're on, we're approaching six uh, this year. Um, it is, we have a substantial gap here and our underinvestment in seismic uh, as a community is substantial. Um, we are certainly being exposed to um, scrutiny for our uh, willingness to protect uh, wetlands uh, and exposure to uh, floods in our community. So I, I would just call out, want to reiterate, I, I am concerned about the size of this bucket. It, 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 30 million is not a meaningful number uh, in terms of the needed investments there. I fully recognize that there are other ways to potentially get the dollars to bridge the gap in our community, but this is the one that kind of keeps me up at night thinking about, maybe it's my exposure to emergency management, but I look at the, the variety of 
really nasty scenarios that our community could face uh, at any given time. And this is an area where we may be able to hedge some of that risk. But Thank you, if I may respond. Um, thank you, Commissioner Mayor Wheeler, if I may respond. I think um, that's a it's a it's something that we've certainly thought quite a bit about, and I think that there's it's going to be with regards to the entire plan. There have been a lot of competing competing demands and, and competing wants within the plan, but I think what I would offer is that. Um, and, and it maybe is worth a point that I should have clarified earlier. Across strategic programs one, two, up uh, two, three, four, and five, we expect to be investing significantly in deferred, in deferred maintenance. I think that's a, a point that I need to make. And as part of that deferred maintenance, we absolutely see seismic retrofits as part of that life health safety suite of things that are going to be eligible in that deferred maintenance. It's a, it's a core part of why we were created, a recognition that when we make energy efficiency investments, that it takes more. Oftentimes, you need to address the roof. You need to address the, the gutters. You need to address other things in order to go in and do the efficiency improvements, because without doing so, they're, they're, they're moot. They don't work. And so. Our front door is the efficiency. That's the door we come in, that's what we're designed to do. But as part of that, uh, I'd say staff took painstaking efforts to really tease out how we can bring in other funding into our projects and get after that deferred maintenance. And so I think this will give us a good opportunity at this scale to really tease out how do we get at seismic across our single family homes, our commercial buildings, and absolutely our community severe weather response. Yeah, fair enough. Right, moving into transportation decarbonization. Um, what, what I'll acknowledge here is this: there's, there's a tremendous amount of interest and excitement here, and I think um, this was a, this was certainly um, a really great, I'd say, a, a good collaboration with stakeholders, PBOT, and others as we brought together our roundtable and teased this out. What we have here is our community responsive grants first. That's to the tune of $35.5 million over five years, and that's intended to support organizations in transitioning their fleets and bringing on electric vehicle car shares, e-mobility, other things to help folks get around more efficiently in ways that are healthier, reduce our emissions. And then we've got two strategic programs that were designed out of that where we saw a substantial need. And that's strategic program six, focused on a comprehensive electric bike access and support program. This program was modeled off of Denver's program as we looked at other jurisdictions, other cities, whether it's San Diego, Seattle, other places. This took the form of Denver's program where we'll be tapping into our local bike shop network and leveraging them as part of distributing and, 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 and moving these vehicles through voucher program. Next outside of this, we have our Equitable Clean Transportation Access Program. And this is the expansion of an existing program that the Bureau of Transportation, PBOT, administers. This is the Transportation uh, Wallet Access for All Program, and it would be expanding that so that folks have uh, flexible means to tapping into TriMet and other bike town, lift other means of moving around so that they can rely less on single family vehicles and move around in ways that are healthier, but, but keep folks, you know, help folks get around in ways that doesn't strictly have, where they don't strictly have to have a car. Okay, next slide. Next up is our green infrastructure investments. First is our uh, community responsive grant allocation for five million. This will be targeted investments in green infrastructure that our community will be investing in. And then we've got more structured programming. First up is our tree canopy maintenance reserve. This is intended to go after existing, and it's important to make this distinction, existing trees in the public right of way that have substantial needs. And so this is about doing the maintenance for and making sure that we're preserving our existing large form trees that are creating shade, species habitat, you know, water and, and, and stormwater mitigation, and most importantly, the, the carbon sequestration. And so this is supporting income qualified households up to 100% area median income in addressing pruning, other pest management, other things that would support maintaining existing trees. The next program here is about, separate from that, it's our equitable tree canopy program. And that program before was in collaboration with Portland Parks and Recreation's Urban Forestry Division. Next program is equitable tree canopy, also in collaboration with the Portland Parks and Recreation's Urban Forestry Division. This program is a, it's a $40 million program over five years to plant up to 25,000 trees. It's about planting new trees and establishing new trees and, and, and maintaining those new trees. 
So I know we worked a lot with stakeholders in our in, in, in Portland Parks to tease out that three years is the appropriate time frame to water and maintain trees and get them off to the right start. In this program, we're doing five years of establishment. And so that's five years of uh, watering in the summer, 20 watering visits a summer, and then early pruning to make sure that the tree is established and has the right structure to grow. So that's, these are investments in green infrastructure. Next. Regenerative Ag, this is our small but mighty and it's a pool of resources that are really focused on that local urban agriculture, urban food production, backyard gardening that brings so many folks out to connect with each other, get their hands in the dirt and produce that local healthy food. This is continuing our community responsive grants with an allocation for 14 million for regenerative ag and then expanding and creating more opportunities for urban farming with a strategic program number nine for six million. Next. I promise just a couple more slides. Um, organizational capacity building. Now, this funding category was also carved out in direct response to our early audit in 2022, wanting to be more explicit about how we shore up this ecosystem collectively as we do this work, recognizing the massive influx of funding that is coming in, not only because of PCEF, but certainly the federal government and the state as well. Our community responsive grants here are our mini grant program. It's what we have historically done. This is providing small seed grants up to $5,000 for projects such as getting a farmer's market stand, a solar and battery power to operator to, to operate their stand. So this is about really seeding those small projects. Um, so small, small funding to, to seed bigger ideas. And then our capacity building program to the tune of 10 million to, is to support our broader infrastructure and make sure that we're, we're implementing our projects well across, across our programs. Next slide. And this is the, the last but catch all of our multiple funding categories that are otherwise, uh, you know, span multiple, that, that span across our funding categories. We've got our community responsive grants here for two million for other greenhouse gas reducing projects um, or sequestration. This is the catch all. So it's where it's probably where we're gonna see our waste minimization and other projects that don't neatly fall into the other categories, but otherwise reduce emissions. We've got strategic program 11. This is in close collaboration with Prosper Portland, where as part of that realignment of 82nd Avenue, we'll be working with Prosper as the front door of supporting the businesses and stabilizing and keeping them there. We'll be coming in on the back door to, to offer them efficiency, energy efficiency improvements so that we can help stabilize and reduce their operating costs as part of these improvements. We've got SB12, which is focused on street tree expansion. This is in close collaboration with Portland Bureau of Transportation and Urban Forestry. And this is about planting large form trees along 82nd Avenue as part of the realignment of that corridor and the investment that's coming in. We've got SB13, targeted electric vehicle financing tools for 35 million. Now, this is about acknowledging that we have people that as a function of their jobs, the things that they have to do, they have to move around. They have to move around the city, they have to drive around, whether it's Lyft drivers or businesses that are moving goods around the city. And so this is supporting them moving out from fossil fuel consuming vehicles into electric vehicles in ways that are gonna be more financially advantageous for them so that we can support them in reducing their operating costs and reducing emissions. SP14 is access to fair and flexible capital. This is where we'll be carving out our consumer financing and business financing pro, um, pro, uh, products uh, with, with, with a range of entities, community development financial institutions, Prosper Portland, others. Um, and this is really intended to support businesses in tapping into the once in a lifetime opportunity made by the Inflation Reduction Act. So this is really that leverage and providing them financing so they can bring in that, that, those federal resources. Then we've got SP15, Federal Climate and Equity Grant Opportunities. And this was directly informed by feedback we received from your offices. Um, and this is an opportunity, it's our local match. Again, trying to tap into the Inflation Reduction Act and other federal and state funding opportunities. But this is about creating a local match fund so that as we go after those federal funds, we've got our 25 to 50% local match that's gonna be provided with this pool um, through a rapid responsive work group structure. And the last but not least is our climate-friendly public schools. Now, 
It's, a, it's just a recognition that schools play a prominent uh, feature across our city, across our geography, and certainly in all of our kids' lives, and that our schools, our public schools, Park Rose, David Douglas, Centennial, and many others are, are short on, on a lot of things they need to do to keep our kids cool and healthy in those buildings. And so this is largely going to be targeted, and we expect to be used for a lot of HVAC improvements in those buildings, but also there's a set aside here for some student-led programming as well. So, uh, next slide. Can I, uh, oh, Commissioner quick, Gonzalez. Yeah, on strategic priority 16 on the last one you just covered, I um, just want to be clear, Portland Public School is not excluded from those I, dollars, they, correct? They are not excluded. There's an allocation formula that we used and vetted with the school districts and others. So, PPS is not excluded. They're, they're getting um, a smaller portion, certainly, than relative to the others. It's, a, it's an equation we used based on the percentage of students that receive free and reduced lunch. And so, relatively speaking, yes, the other school districts, relative to their size, are getting more, but PPS is not excluded. No. So, you're essentially applying an equity lens or a socioeconomic lens to to allocate those dollars. Okay. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. And so you've. Uh, I'm well, going to turn it to. Com well, are there other questions before we in invite our? Um, I had one other one. Though. Okay. Sure. Could you go back to the uh, funding category slide? Uh, it's in the aggregate for each. Uh, keep, go keep going back about. Keep, I'm gonna keep, keep going back, and I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> back. 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 Back, back. Yep, there. Uh, well, one that, more forward. <laughs> that was. Thank you. One. Thank you. Um, you know, I am very appreciative that transportation decarbonization is relatively new um, in this program's consideration. Um, I would say, just acknowledging what we've sort of seen over the last couple of months uh, as council members, uh, we have an impending uh, funding crisis for PBOT. Uh, we have been exposed to uh, pretty substantial data on declining participation in public transit, uh, declining um, bike utilization in our community that were both kind of cornerstones of our city's identity. And so <clears throat> I would certainly be open to exploring with colleagues whether we have put sufficient resources towards transportation decarbonization here. Um, again, that's most not to disrupt the very rigorous public process you've gone through. It's really to supplement that with what we're hearing is, is council members um, and really an impending um, you know, crisis for both our public transit and our transportation body uh, in particular as it impacts biking and walking. So just wanted to put that out there. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, two things to acknowledge about that. Um, the transportation sector is a substantial contributor to our emissions, and there's lifestyle and livability concerns about not having safe and reliable transit, and that's certainly a thing that we consider on the broader climate lens, but also PSEF um, introduced it. And as you acknowledge, it's the first time we've included a transportation um, tranche in the, in the fund. The other piece I want to acknowledge to a point you made earlier is you're absolutely right. Every single one of these buckets is woefully underfunded, but that just speaks to the demand that all of them have. And at some point, we picked $750 million worth of projects that are are fabulous and fantastic, we probably could have picked 750 million other projects in a different portfolio. And that's just to say the demand is very real and we're trying to be responsive both to the community benefits and the things that we know we can roll out, not literally tomorrow, but very quickly because we're in a crisis and this is an urgent response. To the point about the, the funding gap that we're experiencing across the city in terms of our infrastructure, um, other bureaus, um, we're listening, we're hearing that, and we continue to be partners at the table with them to see how we can actually find a delta there. Um, but at the same time, we're also, to your point, um, hearing quite a bit from community what they think the priorities are for this next five years. Okay, thank you. Let's move us back forward, if you don't mind, to slide number 22. Um, and so I think you've heard quite a bit, and I know we will come back up here, but what I want to do is turn things over to uh, a range of folks that have been closely engaged with us through this process, and there's just a sample, many others, and they're back of the climate investment plan that are, many others that beyond that that are not captured here. But what I want to start with is inviting up um, the first three folks, uh, Ramfis Villatoro, Nick, uh, uh, our PCEF committee co-chair, uh, invite up also and just have folks, uh, Nick Blosser from Portland General Electric to come up. And then we'll have Robin Wang also from the PCEF committee um, join us as well and I'll move to the side. And then after those three come up and share a little bit of remarks around the climate community impact from their vantage point, we'll have um, Yashar Vasef from Friends of Trees join as well as Indy Nemkung from Verde. For 
clarification. Um, we mentioned that Nick's coming up from PGE, but the other two are co-chairs, committee members, but what's their identity beyond that? Ramfis joined up. Ramfis is the PCEF committee co-chair, and then Robin Wang is the PCEF committee member. But do they, are they connected to industry in any way or nonprofit? <laughs> I think that I'll let them share their affiliations okay, when they come all. up. <laughs> it just wasn't parallel. I would do, I would do and not do a great job. So let me do that. Like well, to, thanks for being here. I'd like to know who's here. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Wheeler and members of the commission. For the record, my name is Ranfi Sintinovitoro and I am co-chair for the Portland Clean Energy Fund uh, alongside with Megan Horst, who unfortunately is not here today. Um, and for the record, I'm not with industry, but uh, I do hold uh, the East of 82nd seat within the Portland Clean Energy Fund and professionally lead the uh, Oregon chapter, the Blue Green Alliance, a coalition of labor and environmental organizations aimed to address our environmental challenges while we're creating good quality jobs. Uh, I just want to thank uh, members of the committee just for taking the time to connect with Megan and myself um, these past couple months. Uh, I'm not going to take too much time uh, uh, given our past conversations. I'll give it uh, more time to folks uh, here to testify because we have a rock star uh, testimony list. Uh, but what I'll say here is um, tremendous Thank you to the PCEF staff. I don't think I thank them enough. I'm a very critical voice at times, but if you had told me nine months ago that they would pass, we would pass the code updates and go through a community engagement process and come before council with a climate improvement plan and start getting dollars out, I would have said, why? You are all nuts. And then to hear the level of community engagement and the dedicated time, so huge thank you for all those community members who took the time, their own personal time, attending evening meetings, day meetings, countless meetings to get before you a robust climate improvement plan. I still would have thought that would have been crazy. Yet here we are. Here we are. Uh, is the plan perfect? No, it's not perfect. Um, but for the level of engagement and the process undertaken within the span of nine months, it is a great plan and will be an important leg to the stool to how the city will address its commitment for climate action for the next five years. But will be an important leg to the stool for the city of Portland's regeneration and building its climate resilience. I do believe that. Um, additionally, I've been in struck by the engagement from city council. And I just want to say from, as, on behalf of as, myself as co-chair and the committee, just the level of importance and interest to continue building that relationship. Each and every one of you have provided some great thoughts and questions, not just answers or requests, but questions that show that the value of we want a program that works, that works for the city, but is transforming the lives of Portlanders. I believe we do have that plan here. Um, so I just want to support and uplift that, but I understand the importance of continuing to improve the plan before us. And so this plan doesn't just doesn't end here. The next stage of the process about reporting and accountability. And we'll, as committee members will want to continue to engage with council uh, moving forward. Um, so I'm confident the Portland uh, Climate Improvement Plan as presented, uh, again, will be important uh, to meet uh, the City of Portland's uh, Climate Action Plan, its resilience, um, and uh, uh, again, the regeneration for this city. Uh, I will, again, uh, not rehash all the talking points that Sam has already done uh, about process and uh, the different buckets of money. I'll reserve time for the rest of our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, Ranfi, I just want to thank you again for meeting with me and meeting with my team on several occasions. Uh, I, I felt highly respected in terms of having my questions answered, getting the thinking of the committee. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. I think I'm up next. Uh, for the record, Nick Plosser, Portland General Electric Vice President of Public Affairs. Good afternoon and great to see you all. Um, thanks for having me here today. Earlier this year, uh, PGE filed our very first clean energy plan. 
which is our roadmap for delivering reliable, affordable power while achieving our state's 2030 target of reducing carbon emissions by 80%. There are three important components of the plan before you today that I want to highlight because PCEF plays a critical role in achieving them. First, the implementation of energy efficiency measures to help customers conserve power and save money on their energy costs. Second, smart systems including thermostats, water heaters, electric car chargers, and other appliances that support the needs of customers while adding flexibility to the grid. And third, smaller scale community-based renewable energy projects, particularly solar with associated storage, to be located in diverse neighborhoods throughout the city. All three of these components of our clean energy plan will require involvement from the community and cannot be achieved without broad participation from residents and businesses in the city of Portland. I just wanna close my brief comments with this, maintaining reliable power, all while we decarbonize the entire system and manage costs are critical for our collective future and that was uh, no more clear than this past month with the extreme weather event that we saw. Um, and I do want to acknowledge, Commissioner Gonzalez, your comment about resiliency, and I do think a lot of the, a lot, there's a lot of overlap in the programs in terms of support for energy efficiency, support for managed charging for transportation electrification that also helps with, with resiliency. We're finding that in our system. Um, this effort is a significant challenge Decarbonization is a significant challenge that will require action from all of us working together. The state has set ambitious targets for decarbonization. As mentioned earlier, the federal government has made once in a generation investments in support of the clean energy transition. And the city of Portland through PCEF can make equally historic strategic investments that are a crucial component of our collective path forward. We, as the utility, in Portland simply cannot achieve these goals without all of us working together. And this plan is a powerful tool in that effort. We look forward to working together with everyone at the city and the residents and businesses to ensure the clean energy future is beneficial and accessible to all. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, commissioners. For the record, my name is Robin Wang. And um, it was almost exactly four years ago today in this very chamber that I was appointed by this body uh, to serve on the PCEF committee. And um, I'm excited to be here today uh, to comment. Uh, my area of expertise is in, in finance, and um, I'm here to kind of talk a little bit about some of the financial aspects and elements of the uh, climate, in, uh, climate investment plan. The first thing I would like to highlight is that this plan will bring significant additional capital beyond the 750 million from federal, state, and even private capital to, to Portland. As you may be aware, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act, um, two federal programs known affectionately as Bill and IRA, um, brings tremendous funding to address climate change. While this funding is vast, it is, it's gonna be highly competitive and many other cities and regions around the nation will be competing for, for these funds. Um, and as you know, Strategic uh, Program 15 in this plan gives tr Portland a humongous, tremendous advantage, competitive advantage to secure those funds by providing $20 million in matching funds, a requirement that many federal grants will require. So while other jurisdictions you know, maybe struggle to come up with those matching funds, the applications that your agencies and boroughs will be submitting, um, they can state with confidence that uh, those matching funds have been secured. Additionally, uh, the Biden administration has the uh, Justice 40 initiative, which calls for 40% of Bill and Ira's funding to be allocated to historically ma marginalized communities. PCEF, by their very nature, are all Justice 40 eligible or compatible. And so since many PCEF applicants, uh, recipients will likely pursue Bill and IRA funding, PCEF has and will give them the, uh, the opportunities to develop and flex their climate justice muscles so that they're more competitive to receive those fundings. In addition, they'll be more eligible to receive many of the justice-based tax, in, uh, tax credit in, uh, incentives that are part of Bill and IRA uh, funding. And then finally, Strategic Programs 13 and 14 allocates $80 million to finance various cl uh, climate initiatives. 
These funds will serve as a seed capital that will allow community lenders to make fair and affordable loans. The way these loan pro programs often work is that this seed capital will attract other lending capital up to a four to one basis from banks, foundations, institutions, federal, st uh, state dollars, and by this measure alone, this plan could attract an additional $320 million to address climate change here in Portland from, from private sources. Um, I'd like to kind of shift gears now and, and talk a little bit about whether this plan is balanced and fair, uh, a question that I had as a committee member uh, throughout this entire process. And you know, Donnie said earlier that you know, the $750 million in this plan is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, to address uh, Portland's you know, climate uh, goals. And so by def that definition alone, each strategic program in this plan is underfunded. And advocates for specific programs will undoubtedly lobby for more funding. And it's as tempting as you know, it may be to kind of shift the money uh, around, I strongly encourage you not to do so. Um, Sam and others earlier you know, spoke about how this plan was developed through countless hours of transparent input, feedback, engagement with voters, experts, agency staff, and even youth who are not allowed to vote uh, but will be bearing the brunt of climate change. They were involved in this process. And so you know, what you have in front of you represents kind of the collective priority and will um, of the community and I urge you to adopt the plan um, as is. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to be here today. And um, um, yeah, I'll just end. Thank you. I, I'm surprised it was that long ago you were appointed. That's actually <laughs> shocking to me. <laughs> thank you for your A few your more leadership. gray hairs. Thanks, yeah, thanks for reminding us we're all growing old by the second. <laughs> thank you all, appreciate it. Go ahead and invite up Yashar Vasa from Friends of Trees and Indy Namkum from Verde. Great, and then just a reminder, we'll take a 10 minute break after, after you two. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name is Yashar Vasa. I'm the executive director of Friends of Trees. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, on behalf of Friends of Trees, I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak with you about Tree Canopy and the CIP. In 2021, the Washington DC-based American Forests ranked Portland as the second most inequitable urban canopy in the nation. The lower your income and the more diverse your neighborhood, the less likely you are to experience the physical and psychological benefits of trees. This dynamic introduces stark consequences, such as the association found by Dr. Vivek Shandas of PSU between low canopy neighborhoods in East County and tragic deaths during extreme heat waves, such as the 2021 heat dome event. Additionally, recent peer-reviewed science published by researcher Jeffrey Donovan at the US Forest Service uh, assess tree planting data through our previous contract with the Bureau of Environmental Services to unearth the life-saving benefit of trees. Donovan found that on average, 11.7 new trees planted in each neighborhood were associated with 15.6 fewer non-accidental deaths and five fewer cardiovascular deaths per year. In particular, he found mature trees are workhorses for bu public benefit and we must maintain and protect them. Trees. Uh, with this research in mind, the introduction of PSEF's $40 million equitable tree canopy program, the ETC, could not have been timelier. Last year, you approved the ETC in, in, in a showing of responsiveness to this growing uh, and emerging threat. And I want to thank you for that responsiveness. Today is yet another opportunity to be responsive. It's my word of the day. The CIP is the product of robust community engagement by the PSEF team. Specific to my experience, I want to share that the PSEF tree canopy stakeholder process was one of the most meaningful engagement opportunities I have had with the city of Portland. No, Friends of Trees did not always get what we desired through the ETC. However, PSEF staff expertly navigated challenging conversations toward compromise. The ETC stakeholder process has landed with deep alignment between Friends of Trees, the Bureau of Environmental Services, and Portland Urban, Forest, Urban Forestry. Some might argue that's no small feat. Uh, truly, PSF CIP has emerged as a leading model for shifting funding towards city bureau and community co-led projects 
If my experience is representative of the outreach around the rest of the CIP, Council should not hesitate to move forward with the CIP as is. I'm excited by the CIP programs to meet the needs and urgency the community has highlighted. On a personal level, I want to thank Sam and the team at PISA for strengthening my faith in collaborative outcomes between local government and community. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to comment today. For the record, my name is Indy Namkung. I'm the Transportation Justice Coordinator for Verde. Our mission is to serve communities by building environmental wealth through social enterprise, outreach, and advocacy. Uh, communities like ours in the Cully neighborhood where we've been based for 18 years now. It's why we joined the effort to create PSEF in the first place with the original 2018 ballot measure, and it's why I'm joining you today as we approach another milestone, to urge you to pass the climate investment plan you have before you today and begin a new chapter for this program. I'm here specifically to talk about PSEF's first ever investments in transportation decarbonization. When we make clean transportation affordable, it is an anti-poverty strategy as much as it is a climate strategy. Transportation is the second largest expense for most households in Portland, just behind housing itself. The Climate Investment Plan's transportation programs will put hundreds and in many cases thousands of dollars directly back in the pockets of low-income people and people of color in our city every year. And that money can be life-changing. I know personally it was for me. When my rent increased substantially last year, it was good transit access and an e-bike that made it feasible for me to sell my car. I saved hundreds of dollars a month on payments and insurance and I was able to hang on to my apartment and stay in my neighborhood. When everybody who wants those options has them, we all win on climate, on air quality, on safety and on quality of life. And this plan will build more of those clean and affordable, abundant choices for communities who have been harmed more often than they've been helped by the transportation investments of the past. The e-bike access program in this plan would be the largest municipal program of its kind in the United States, reaching at least 6,000 people over the next five years. It's going beyond distribution. It's providing education, funding for safety and equipment, and training for 50 new e-bike mechanics. This is how we can make our public dollar stretch. We're reducing emissions, supporting small businesses, we're building a diverse workforce, and we're ensuring that everybody in our communities can get where they're going all at the same time. We're also building on the successes of the transportation wallet program that's been growing at the city since 2017. Participants already say that they're saving money, they're stressing less about their monthly budget, and their ability to get where they need to go. This is what access means in real life, and we're going to be able to extend it to 12 to 15,000 more people in the next five years with this funding. I would invite PBOT staff to correct my math, but uh, I believe this would at least double the program's reach to date. That's thousands of additional transit riders, micromobility users returning to our streets or heading there for the very first time. So it's meaningful beyond words to also be directly investing in new ideas through the community responsive grants in this category at the heart of PSEF. Our community members know what they need. Safety on their neighborhood streets, affordable options to connect them to work, to school, other basic needs. They've been asking for this for years. And year after year, so many of these projects get delayed, downsized, or deprioritized. This SIP offers a new way forward for them. I've had the honor of working closely with many PSEF grantees, supporters, and staff for over three years now. In that time, I've seen the program grow beyond expectations, and even through growing pains, come to deliver so many responsive and creative projects that simply would not have happened otherwise. In that time, I've also spoken to people across the country who look to PSEF, who look to Portland as a blueprint for what's possible in their communities. So commissioners, I urge you to be first again, vote yes on this SIP, for, and for those who are watching, prove that something better is possible. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Thank, Thank you all. So, uh, colleagues, uh, at this point, we will take a 10-minute recess. It's now uh, about 10 after. We will reconvene at 4.20. For those of you who have signed up for public testimony, and there's quite a few, plan on two and a half minutes for your public testimony. I want to make sure that we get through everybody's public testimony today. So plan on two and a half minutes, if you can, for that public testimony. We're in recess.
right, we're back in session. We are now in the public testimony phase, two and a half minutes each. Please name for the record. The mics should be about six inches away. Keelan will call your names. Thank you, Mayor. First up, we have Ted Labby, followed by Damon Mott's story and Candace Avalos. Good afternoon, Mayor, Councilors. My name is Ted Labby, and I live in the Kearns neighborhood. I am co-director of DPAVE, which reclaims pavement as green space at schools, churches, and other community hubs across the Portland metro region. This community-led initiative alleviates flooding from stormwater and cools the city in the face of worsening heat waves. DPAVE is an active collaborator with PISA. I'm here to support adoption of the Climate Investment Plan, and I believe that the SIP will make Portland's Clean Energy Fund investments more strategic and aligned, where the greatest drawdowns in carbon emissions are needed, and help elevate the critical role that green infrastructure like trees, stormwater planters, and parks play in carbon sequestration. I also maintain that all this spending will not be enough. Other actions by the city are urgently needed, and I want to talk about two with my remaining time. First, floodplains. The city cannot continue to slow walk its proposed weak floodplain protection regulations. Under the city's current proposal, flood prone areas are given allowances for new development, and there are loopholes that delay or render regulations effective, putting many Portlanders at risk. The city should adopt interim measures under the biological opinion immediately until permanent protections can be developed. Second, cumbersome zoning regulations like the arcane and outdated conditional use review. Don't worry, I'm not going to make your eyes glaze over with, with uh, zoning regulations, but I want you to know that many, many in the city know that the city is a leader in parking reform and has rolled back parking requirements. This is a good thing for housing affordability, climate resilience, and other goals. Fewer appreciate that hundreds of sites across the city, like churches, schools, and other community hubs, remain encumbered by conditional use overlays. These are the places that are community resilience hubs that Commissioner Gonzalez mentioned earlier that are gonna be so important for the next heat wave or natural disaster. But building retrofits are hamstrung by zoning regulations. If a proposed change of use at one of these sites alters the parking by just one space, one space, then the Bureau of Development of Services hits it with a conditional use review, which costs money, costs time, and puts off, delays, defers needed retrofits from a climate resiliency or natural disaster provision. This is a little known provision. I have a first row seat uh, in front of this. In 2018 at St. Stephen's Church in Southeast Portland, the threat of a conditional use review forced the displacement of child, child's work learning preschool and the loss of a nature playground that DPAVE had previously built. At the African American Morning Star Church in Cully, BDS, the Bureau of Development Services, is currently requiring a conditional use review to reclaim surplus parking for trees and a soft surface play area for kids. The kids currently play on the pavement. Never mind that over 60 parking spaces will remain for a congregation that numbers about 25. Please go forward with adoption of the CIP, but please don't stop there. Consider what reforms are needed to bolster our community in the face of a rapidly changing climate. Adoption of strong floodplain regulations and rolling back outdated conditional use reviews over parking are two at the top of my list. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. For the record, my name is Damon Mott Story, and I am the director of the Oregon chapter of the Sierra Club the 130-year-old grassroots environmental organization that is the largest of its kind in the nation. Since 1978, Oregon Sierra Club members and supporters have supported uh, protecting working la public lands and building the environmental movement. I was recently tapped to lead the Oregon chapter and support its 73,000 statewide members and supporters in filling our mission to explore, enjoy, and protect the planet. The Sierra Club endorsed the Portland Clean Energy Fund five years ago, and I'm here today to express our continued support for the fund, and in particular, this climate investment plan as written. <laughs> I myself have watched closely as the Portland Clean Energy Fund has gotten off the ground and have been particularly impressed by the program staff's hard work, the committee, and the leadership of Commissioner Rubio. They rose to the occasion with this plan through their dedication, holding an intentional, thoughtful, and inclusive process that involved frontline committees, subject matter experts, governments, contractors, labor, young people, environmental organizations, and more. The result is a thorough plan with strong vetting across key sectors. It has good substance and metrics and was developed with good process. It addresses the carbon intensive sectors of transportation and buildings, invests heavily in training workers for clean energy jobs, and grows regenerative agriculture and tree canopy. 
It allows us to think big and plan for the long haul, which is essential because the clean energy transition is a long haul issue. With the passage of this plan, we can be a national role model for what it looks like to be smart and proactive in supporting people's resilience to extreme climate events while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That is what 65% of the Portland voters said yes to in 2018, and this multi-year framework represents our most comprehensive installment to date in making good on that contract with the electorate. We're already seeing how more vulnerable members of our community, communities of color, low-income Portlanders, elderly residents, are harmed the most by extreme weather, such as the deadly 2021 heat dome. Clarity around how we make big investments to address these issues will benefit all of us, but especially those who are the most under-resourced among us. Mayor and commissioners, I urge all of you to please support this climate investment plan as written. You can count on seeing the Sierra Club again as we support the implementation of the climate investment plan and help the city of Portland in succeeding meeting its climate goals. We must make sure that the trees we plant today are still healthy and growing in five, 10, and 15 years. Thank you for your time. Please support the climate investment plan as written. Thank you, perfectly timed as well. Candace, good afternoon. All right. Well, good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today in strong support of the vision set out in the Climate Investment Plan. I'm Candace Avalo, she, her pronouns, and the executive director of Verde, an environmental justice nonprofit. The heart of our work is in the Cully neighborhood of Northeast Portland, where we do our grassroots community organizing and leadership development, policy advocacy, and turn theory into action with our social enterprise by building environmental wealth for low income and people of color communities. I feel incredibly blessed to be surrounded in this room and on this list of testifiers by critical allies who have been on this journey from the early vision of PSEF to the ballot measure, the campaign, to implementation, and now to a huge milestone of creating a five-year vision for how to invest these dollars strategically back into environmental justice communities across our city. If you take anything away from my testimony and those of my colleagues, I want you to understand the deep community support behind PCEF's vision and our desire for our city to honor the hard work that has brought us to this day. Honoring this vision means full-throated support for the Climate Investment Plan with your voice and your vote as our city's <coughs> excuse me, elected leadership. My colleagues will be highlighting important areas of this plan that speak to the work we're doing on the ground, but I want to spend a moment to lift up a particular section of the plan that needs further investment in the future, which is building capacity for community-based organizations, or CBOs. Verde is turning 18 years old in a few weeks, and we have spent almost two decades growing our capacity to bridge the green divide in our community. But if we truly want to fulfill our vision to invest in environmental infrastructure, we must equally invest in the frontline organizations and leaders who are nurturing potential projects, developing the next generation of leaders, and can help the city strategically place dollars back into the community. We have no more time to waste on taking bold climate action, and this climate investment plan is a critical step towards securing a stronger, more resilient future for Portland. I urge you to show your commitment to that future with your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Hannah Cruz, followed by Bob Salinger and Jim Labby. Good afternoon. Would you like to go ahead and start? Sure. Mayor Wheeler and commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on the Portland Clean Energy Fund's Climate Investment Plan. For the record, my name is Hannah Cruz, and I'm working with Energy Trust of Oregon. Pursuant to our grant agreement with the Oregon Public Utility Commission, Energy Trust does not advocate in support of or in opposition to policy initiatives like this proposal before you today. I'm here to offer our perspective as a clean energy program administrator and an organization with a long history of working with the city of Portland. Energy Trust is an independent nonprofit delivering cost-effective energy efficiency and small-scale renewable energy programs to utility customers throughout Oregon. And this includes Portland's residents and businesses who are customers of Portland General Electric, Pacific Power, and Northwest Natural. We work with our utility partners, local and state governments, a robust trade alley network with 1,600 businesses, a growing list of community partners, and now PSEF grantees to provide customers with information, technical services, and incentives to help make their clean energy projects a reality. While we are broadening how we serve and deliver benefits to all customers, including those we've underserved, people of color, people with low and moderate incomes, rural businesses, rural customers, small businesses, 
there are so many more that we can serve and help. Many of these same Portlanders are at the heart of PCEF and through which the Climate Investment Plan commits greater service to in the next five years. At Energy Trust, we're rolling out strategies, community partnerships, and approaches to reach all Portlanders, and still the need is substantial. The PCEF Climate Investment Plan positions the city to help fill the need and make vital energy, climate, and equity investments in homes, apartments, nonprofits, small businesses, and community spaces. We've been on uh, five of the subject matter expert roundtables uh, that started earlier this year, and we've shared in those forums our experience and understanding of the gaps in service to customers, many of which are now part of the strategies of the Climate Investment Plan. This includes identifying ways to overcome the long-standing owner-renter split incentive in residential and commercial settings, preserving energy efficiency and renewable energy investments in multifamily construction and major retrofits so these long-term investments aren't value engineered out of projects, and knowing that energy efficiency projects need to be fully funded for Portlanders to participate, with many requiring home and building repairs to enable the efficiency work. Energy Trust ratepayer funding has limits and can only cover some parts of these projects, and PCEF can help fill the remaining need. <laughs> Together, PCEF, Energy Trust, the Portland community, and our partners can make energy efficiency, renewable energy, and climate justice a reality for more Portlanders. Should the council pass this plan, Energy Trust stands ready to work closely with PCEF staff and stakeholders to strengthen our connected programs and maximize the impact of our collective funding. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you. Hey, Bob. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and members of City Council. Uh, for the record, my name is Bob Salinger. I'm the Urban Conservation Director for Willamette Riverkeeper. Uh, I was involved in the drafting of, of the PCEF uh, ballot measure and uh, worked on the campaign, and I'm strongly supportive, Willamette Riverkeeper is strongly supportive of this measure. Uh, and we greatly appreciate the uh, work that has been done to date. I'm here today to suggest some places that I think there could be improvements, but I want to be clear, I'm not asking you to make any changes today out of respect for the process that has occurred, I'm urging you to move it forward. That being said, though, I do think there are some areas that as we move into implementation uh, and also outside of this process where we can address some of the things that I think uh, could be improved upon. Uh, the first is green infrastructure. Green infrastructure was always a relatively small part of this measure. Uh, it and regenerative agriculture were only 15%, uh, which, which I always felt was too small, but that was what it was and what we passed. It's been lowered to 12% here, so it's even smaller. And I think the city needs to do a much, much better job when it comes to climate change of thinking about natural solutions uh, that provide multiple benefits, um, and make our environment healthier. Uh, too often it's on the development side of the equation, and I think we're continuing that. I think in the implementation phase, there are opportunities because there's some very uh, flexible places where we can actually step that up a good deal, and I would urge, uh, I urge you to do that as we move forward. Uh, the second is a more specific one, it's mitigation banks. Uh, we'd hope that those would be included in this measure. They're not um, explicitly uh, included, but I think there's also ways to think about those in community projects down the road uh, as being eligible for funding. Uh, I do think we need to move forward on mitigation banks. It's something we've been talking about for 20 years, uh, and that's a way to mitigate as we develop and also get those climate benefits. So I hope we'll continue to think about that. Uh, the third is that we really need to be thinking about uh, carbon sequestration and keeping that front and center. This is a complex measure. It was designed to be that way. That's very intentional so that we really do do better on the environment and uh, achieve equity goals and inclusion goals. Uh, but at the same time, we need to make sure the projects that we forward do actually achieve uh, real significant benefits in terms of climate. So uh, I would urge you to think about that. The last thing is that as we move forward, the voters have spoken very, very strongly about their desire to see us invest in climate strategies, and we're going to invest $750 million in that in these voluntary strategies. It would be a huge mistake to make this kind of investment at the same time that we're rolling back regulatory protections for our environment, and that is happening now. The floodplain plan, as you've already heard, has been weakened. You're going to get a proposal in a couple of weeks to roll back green roof protections, and we cannot be moving forward on these voluntary strategies and simultaneously taking with the other hand on the regulatory strategies that are also critically important. We need to do both, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Jim Labby. Jim, are you with us? Uh, we'll move on to Ariadna Falcon Gonzalez online. Hello. Good afternoon, um, Mayor and Commissioners. 
Thank you for having me. My name is Ariadna and I use she, her, Aya pronouns. I'm the Getting There Together GTT Coalition Manager. GTT is a multicultural, multi-generational coalition that centers and uplifts the voices and needs of people most impacted by transportation inequities through education, advocacy, access, and leadership. I am here to voice GTT's strong support for the climate investment plan. I, on behalf of GTT, have the privilege of participating in the transportation decarbonization roundtable, and I can attest to the thorough and inclusive process that has gone into crafting this plan by city staff and members of the community. The CIP is a crucial step towards addressing climate change while promoting equity and community leadership. GTT endorses the CIP's focus on advancing transportation programs and projects that support transportation needs and address the barriers of underserved communities. In particular, I want to highlight the importance of providing equitable access to e-bikes. E-bikes can be a game changer for many individuals, offering an eco-friendly mode of transportation that is accessible to a wide range of people. However, to ensure that everyone can benefit from this technology, we must address the barriers to access. The CIP aims to do this not only by providing more e-bikes, but also ensuring access to safety equipment, lightning, waterproof gear, charging infrastructure, secure storage areas, and locks. Additionally, GTT supports the expansion of the transportation wallet program in the CIP. The CIP is a well-crafted strategy that aligns with the goals of reducing emissions and enhancing community well-being. Um, I urge the city to, to the I urge the city to pass a plan as it is. Uh, recognizing the digital work that has gone into its development and the positive impact it can have on our city and its residents. Lastly, I want to know that in the vast landscape of transportation, underfunding is prevalent in all corners, and the issue transcends the scope of PSEF. The CIP, although powerful, is one of many solutions that address this challenge. DGT endorses the CIP and urges councils to pass it without delay. Thank you. Thanks, Adriana. Uh, legal counsel, I've had a request that could you restate the council rules with regard to registered lobbyists, please? Could you reread that just so that, that everybody knows what their obligation is? Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. Thank you. Next up, we have Micah Meskel. Welcome. Mayor and City Council members, my name is Micah Meskel and I'm the Assistant Conservation Director for Portland Audubon, who I am representing today. Um, and I am here today to strongly support the climate investment plan as is. Um, it's taken us five years to get to this historic moment on the precipice of approving three quarters of a billion dollars in funding towards building climate resilience in our communities that need it most. And I am so excited. <laughs> Portland Audubon has been really proud to stand in support of our BIPOC-led partner organizations that have led this five-plus year effort that makes the ambitious plan possible today. Over the time, over that time, um, Portland Audubon and myself has closely followed the build-out of this innovative program. Um, we've lended our expertise and insight to inform its evolution and supported PCEF staff's smart and necessary changes to the program as it has matured innovated and adjusted to new conditions. That's why we are really excited to support the CIP as written today as it truly encapsulates the community's vision. It's a product of deliberate and extensive community outreach and involvement, and the plan could bring Portland to the forefront of addressing the climate crisis that centers on building climate resilience for the community in a holistic fashion. Portland Audubon is especially excited about the programs that integrate natural climate solutions in the proposed CIP. And as Sam and other PCEF staff know, um, we will hope to shift more funding in this direction over time as um, the program continues to evolve. We are especially excited about the Equitable Tree um, Canopy Program that Yashar highlighted earlier, the Tree Canopy Maintenance Fund, um, the 82nd Avenue Street Tree Expansion, and Green Infrastructure Community Responsive Grants Program. Um, in addition to sequestering carbon, the, the projects funded from these buckets have a significant opportunity to provide the community with countless other health, resiliency, and economic benefits, both to nearby residents and the broader ecosystem. Um, 
especially when they are scaled at the level um, that this, um, this EIP um, brings forward. We hope to help inform future PSEF programs to expand in these spaces. Um, and um, I'll close with, again, asking you to pass the CIP as is um, and move Portland along the path um, of climate justice. Thank you. Next up, we have Jackie Trigger online. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to comment today. I'm Jackie Trager, Campaign Manager for Climate and Transportation at the Oregon Environmental Council, speaking today on behalf of Jana Gastelum, OEC's Executive Director. We strongly support PSEF and the Climate Investment Program and encourage you to support it as written. The Oregon Environmental Council is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, membership based organization that advances innovative, collaborative, and equitable solutions to Oregon's environmental challenges for today and future generations. We've been working to make Oregon a leader in addressing urgent environmental and community issues since 1968. Since our founding, we have advocated for meaningful public policy to address problems upstream and create benefits for communities throughout our state. The climate crisis is personal to those of us in Portland. Six years ago, Jana's child's first day of kindergarten was canceled because of extreme heat and smoke. Two years ago, 100 people died from extreme heat, including many in our region. We must meet this moment. To reduce the impacts of climate change, we need to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions and invest in community benefits. We need solutions at all levels, federal, state, local, and community-based. PSEF, which OEC's board voted to endorse and support at the ballot, is a critical piece of the puzzle. We appreciate its design to cut climate pollution, create economic opportunity, and attend to workforce needs. In particular, we support the intentionality to repair historic harms and injustices and ensure the resiliency of all of Portland's communities, beginning with the most vulnerable. Black and Indigenous communities, people experiencing low income, and community members who are most at risk to the impacts of extreme climate events, including the elderly, young children, pregnant people, and those who are ill or have chronic conditions. To reach those in need requires community engagement, and we appreciate the evolution of partnerships outlined in the CIP. Was developed through a deliberate and inclusive process that involved frontline communities, environmental organizations, subject matter experts, governments, contractors, labor, and more. We should respect the work of the many different stakeholders that went into creating the CIP. If any adjustments are needed, it should be brought back to the process for adjustments. To community leadership and investment at the heart of PSEF is reflected in the CIP, as is the urgent need for action on climate change. Thank you for your consideration. Hope you vote yes as written. Thanks, Jackie. Next up, we have Nikita Darianani, followed by Sharice Bach and Amandeep Sohi. <coughs> Welcome. <coughs> Would you like to go ahead and start, please? Mm, sure. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to st testify today in full support of the Portland Clean Energy Community Benefit Fund's Climate Investment Plan. My name is Nikita Darianani, and I am the Climate and Energy Policy Manager at the Coalition of Communities of Color and a registered lobbyist. As early advocates for PSEF, we see the Climate Investment Plan as an unparalleled opportunity to take bold action on climate, and to do so at a scale that will actually have a meaningful impact on Portlanders whose lives and well-being are at stake. Over the past few years, community members have experienced the impacts of climate change through historic heat waves, ice storms, wildfires, and more. Through surveys, workshops, and meetings we've held with community members, they've made it clear that Portlanders need upgrades to their homes to make them more energy efficient and resilient to climate extremes, extremes and more green spaces in their neighborhoods. Frontline communities want to see the benefits of a clean energy future through more job opportunities and lower utility bills without furthering displacement. And the CIP advances the goals adva outlined in the Climate Emergency Declaration that direct the city to invest in projects that provide these benefits. 
The CIP represents the hard work of staff and dozens of leaders who came together to shape and refine the plan. This is the type of policymaking that we should all aspire to, where government builds genuine community partnerships and engages those who will be most impacted alongside subject matter experts. PSEF has made Portland a leader for climate justice, and the Climate Investment Plan will continue our city on that trajectory. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and we urge this council to be leaders in climate action and pass the Climate Investment Plan. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners and Mayor Wheeler. Uh, my name is Sheree Spock, and I'm here representing 350 PDX, which is a uh, Portland-based climate justice nonprofit with thousands of members in the metro area. Along with many other organizations and individuals, volunteers with 350PDX advocated for and put a lot of organizing power into the formation of PSEF, gathering thousands of signatures and knocking on thousands of doors to get this on the ballot and passed. And so we've been excited and uh, cheering along as uh, PSEF has progressed in the last several years and many exciting programs have been implemented providing funding for excellent initiatives led by environmental justice and community-based organizations. Now we enthusiastically support the new climate investment plan, the process of seeking and incorporating community engagement to create this plan has been great and we appreciate that it has been developed with input from those on the front lines of climate impacts and environmental harm. The CIP reflects well the guiding principles of PSEF, being justice driven and community powered. The CIP focuses on measurably reducing greenhouse gas emissions while materially improving community experience with a focus on equitable outcomes and affordability all while emphasizing critical issues that have historically lacked funding, such as equitable tree canopy and affordable access to public transit. So we're, there are a lot of things to be excited about in this program, such as uh, additions of biking and e-bikes, uh, retrofits for renters, and uh, we're also glad to see the plan creating pathways for youth programs, such as green workforce exposure and trainings for youth and climate-friendly public school project, uh, which involves participatory budgeting. So there are a lot of great things about this plan that we're excited to support. We hope that the combination of city-level support and guidance for this program will help community-based organizations and businesses to be more effective and that this can continue to be a program that focuses on value added to what the city already does and ensuring that environmental justice remains at the center of this program. So we are hopeful that you will vote and approve this uh, climate investment plan as written. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you today as you all consider adopting the climate investment plan that PSEF has brought forward. Uh, my name is Amdeep Sohi, I use he and they pronouns, and as Verity's Community Engagement Coordinator, I come to you today as a representative of the 82nd Avenue Coalition, led by Oregon Walks, uh, where Verde is joined by Apano and Unite Oregon. Um, I would first like to start by acknowledging that the PSEP team has been hard at work for months on the enormous task of redesigning the PSEP program. It was an immense lift, and I commend them for all their work. Uh, speaking from my personal experience, they were everywhere. They hosted multiple one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks from the 82nd Avenue Coalition. They held multiple topic-specific roundtables. There were virtual, hybrid, and in-person public events, surveys, polls, and the list goes on. Um, I say all this to convey that I applaud the level of public outreach and engagement and hope we can honor that work and diligence by confirming the plan that they brought to you today. As a coalition, we are thrilled that the 82nd Avenue has specific funding. We believe this is a reflection that 82nd Avenue, one of the most diverse places in all of Portland, but also one of the hottest and highly paved, is in particular need uh, of climate resilience and mitigation intervention. There are many needs for green space and depaving along the corridor that this funding can make a reality. After improved safety for pedestrians, especially for kids uh, trying to get to and from school, uh, tree canopy and green space is the topic our coalition hears about the most. As is noted in the Climate Investment Plan, the 82nd Avenue Coalition worked with an incredible group of PSU graduate students to outline part of a tree canopy plan um, along 82nd Avenue with many recommendations on how to increase tree canopy. I'd also like to thank, uh, thank you to Commissioner Rubio for joining us for that presentation of their work. Um, one last thing I'd like to note is that 82nd Avenue is a highly car-centric roadway and with the potential for tolling on I-205, it may get even more diverted vehicles. While we support electric vehicle charging infrastructure, uh, electric vehicles reduce air pollution, particulate matter, and noise, 
we see a future for 82nd that isn't so car centric and has more housing and more walkability. As you implement the CIP, we encourage your team and the PCEF team to consider how much is invested in car charging infrastructure that would only further cement the auto-centric nature of the corridor. Instead, we hope that those electrification dollars will be spent on electric micromobility that gets people out of cars and on the street supporting the amazing businesses up and down the corridor. Um, thank you so much for your time today and the opportunity to speak in favor of the climate investment plan brought to you by the Portland Clean Energy Fund. Uh, I hope that you will vote to adopt the plan and, keep, and help create a greener Portland. Thank you. Thanks for being here, all three of you. Next up, we have Matson Rodriguez, followed by Camilo Marquez and Jane Camo. Thank you. Um, so Dear uh, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity uh, to provide testimony in support of the adoption of the Portland Clean Energy Community Benefits Fund Climate Investment Plan. My name is Madison Rodriguez, she, her, and I'm a Unite Oregon Climate and Environmental Justice Policy Coordinator. Here at Unite Oregon, our commitment is to strategize and adopt climate strategies and solutions that mitigate the effects of climate change on vulnerable Oregonians. The time is now to address urgent community needs and prepare communities for climate change effects. For example, this past legislative session, our organization built a coalition for the passage of the HB 2409 climate package for Community Resilience Hub. These hubs will support the day-to-day -day life and activate during disruptions and recovery efforts before, during, and after climate-related emergencies and other natural disasters personalized by community needs. And that's one of the many solutions our communities are working on to support our most vulnerable populations. Because environmental justice is about the intersectionality of people and climate. And this is what this climate investment plan aims to do to create more green jobs, more funding for renewable energy buildings and generative agriculture and more examples. It also already includes leadership of communities of color, trust and relationship buildings, which oftentimes are left out out of these conversations. And it seems like it has a diverse coalition of supporters. Uh, this plan is designed to provide from like communities uh, through culture, through like response, really up to their needs and very personalized. Uh, and this is only an opportunity that we need and we must do in order to build power within communities. Uh, and protect our constituents. Uh, the world is changing, climate change is changing, and we also need to be changing uh, with those changes as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Camilo Marquez. All right, let's move Recording on. in progress. Oh, okay, uh, let's move on to Jane Camo online. Jane, can you unmute? Jane, you're muted. Okay, uh, we can come back to Jane. Next, we have uh, Brett. Wait, she just unmuted. Oh. Jane, are you there? Jane? Jane, we'll come back to you. We, we can't hear you for some reason. Jane, we see you. Oh. Hi, sorry, I didn't hear my name called, but I'm assuming the last speaker didn't show, so I'm on? You're, you're on, Jane, go for it. I, I'm not hearing the volume. Can you hear us? Go, um, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Jane Comalt. I chair Portland Public Schools Climate Crisis Response Committee, but I'm here unofficially as an individual in support of Portland Clean Energy Fund's Climate Investment Plan. I urge Portland City Council to vote yes today. Acknowledging the climate crisis, Portland voters said yes to PCEF in 2018 and the climate justice and climate action it promised. This plan represents input gathered from a broad and inclusive process to determine how to derive the most benefit from the fund and the community is ready to see it implemented. I support the plan in its entirety, but one area I want to highlight and applaud is the inclusion of funding for climate-friendly public schools. Portland Public Schools is the largest single property owner in Portland, 
with 49,000 students in 81 schools, and that's just one district among several in the city. The PPS school board showed leadership on climate change when they adopted an ambitious climate crisis, climate justice, and sustainable practices policy last year. And the district is moving forward on its goal to reach net zero by 2040 and to engage and ensure wellness and climate resilience among its school community. But funding for climate action and climate justice is scarce for public schools. I heard a question earlier about PPS's bond measures, which have provided funds to improve its building stock, but it's largely allocated for high school modernization with a sprinkling for other deferred maintenance. It's nowhere near what's required to bring efficiency and resilience to its building stock as we face the climate crisis. There's a massive opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve climate resiliency via improvements to public school grounds and buildings. Public schools access to PSAF seed capital will help augment other sources of funding for climate friendly improvements and will have concrete benefits to PSAF priority communities. Um, lastly, I want to applaud the funding earmarked for student led initiatives. We know that today's youth feel anxiety about the climate crisis. And we also know that one of the most effective ways to boost mental health is by taking concrete action and feeling part of a larger community of people taking action. So thank you to the Climate Investment Plan for recognizing these needs and opportunities to make an impact for our youth. Thanks for listening and please vote yes on the Climate Investment Plan. All right, thank you, Jane, thank you. Next up, we have Brett Morgan. Mayor Wheeler, members of the um, Portland City Council, for the record, my name is Brett Morgan. I work for 1000 Friends of Oregon and I'm a registered lobbyist with the City of Portland. I'm here today to speak in strong support of the Climate Action Plan as currently proposed for PSEF uh, and would like to offer a few points of consideration. One, I'd like to speak just high praises of PSEF in general. As a fiscal sponsor for the Getting There Together Coalition in an earlier grant cycle, I can't speak enough high praises for the dedication and uh, specificity that staff have brought in addressing questions and working with community to bring forward grants and bring projects into the real world. I'll also, in my second point, just say uh, we speak in strong support for the uh, transportation decarbonization category. As you all are well aware, within Oregon, 40% of greenhouse gas emissions come um, from the transportation sector, something that's mirrored very closely within Multnomah County. And so it's strategies in which we can uh, rapidly employ decarbonization within our community uh, is essential for us to meet our state, local, and federal climate goals. Uh, and there is a conversation around specific safety projects uh, and the ability to invest PSEF funds in those. We'd like to speak in strong support of continuing conversation on how we can utilize PSEF uh, and PSEF funding to fill needed transportation needs within our community. So I'll stop there and keep it brief, but just wanted to speak in strong support of the uh, Climate Action Plan as currently proposed. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Greer Ryan. Welcome, thank you for being here. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. My name is Greer Ryan and I'm the Clean Buildings Policy Manager for Climate Solutions, also I believe a registered lobbyist. Um, climate Solutions is a regional nonprofit focused on accelerating clean energy solutions to the climate crisis. We mostly work on state policy and regulatory issues related to climate and energy justice and our energy buildings and transportation sectors. I'm here today in full support of the Portland Clean Energy Community Benefits Fund and the Climate Investment Plan as written. Uh, PSEF represents our city's commitment to climate and environmental justice, uh, specifically as it provides Portland residents who need it most with access to life-saving climate resilient solutions, including weatherization and heat pumps, which are crucial for staying cool during the scorching heat waves that have become all too common. Although others have already said it, it's important to acknowledge again that the overwhelming majority of Portland voters supported PSEF and its clear mission to reduce climate pollution and tailor solutions to meet the unique needs of our community members who are disproportionately harmed by this crisis. At Climate Solutions, we work regularly with groups across the country who work on local, state, federal clean energy policy. I can't tell you how many times PSEF has been brought up as a true model for climate action and ensuring robust community benefits from clean energy solutions. Passing the climate investment plan as written without diverting funds to other uses is critical to demonstrating on a national level just how successful a policy developed by and for environmental justice communities can be if given the opportunity. Now is the time to accelerate our efforts, not redirect them. 
In June 2020, this council declared a climate emergency, recognizing the growing urgency and severity of the climate crisis. The latest Intergovernmental pa Panel on Climate Change report underscores the need to peak greenhouse gas emissions by 2025 and reduce them by 43% by 2030. This requires, Recording in progress. this requires an all hands on deck approach and every city, including ours, has a responsibility to address emissions and bolster resilience. We must seize the opportunity presented by this program to hasten clean energy investments, decarbonize our homes, buildings, and transportation sectors, provide job training, and generally improve the resilience of our communities. Our city is a thriving community of nonprofits and growing network of businesses eager to work to deliver these benefits directly to Portlanders. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, appreciate it. And that completes testimony. All right, very good. Thank you, everybody who testified. And Keelan, I, I think there must have been, was there a glitch in the system? We got it sorted. Yeah, a little one. It's all sorted out. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks. No, no problem. Thanks for, for troubleshooting it. Uh, good. So that completes public testimony. Colleagues, do we have any more questions before we move this to second? Very good. This is a first reading. Thank you, everybody who testified. It was great testimony. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. And we are adjourned. <laughs>